はい、帝国になりましたので。Now it is time and we would like to start. Hello and thank you very much for coming up to CCBT Meetup. Hello, Volume 2. Hello from the Global Creative Laboratories. And this is Volume 2, Cultural Hubs of the World Responding to the Times. This is CCBT Shimada. Thank you very much. And we're on live today. At Hello Laboratories, we just abbreviate ourselves and we call ourselves Hello Love. And we started in February this year, and this is our second volume. Starting in 2022, in October, we have been starting as CCBT, so it is just only one in several months past. And this CCBT has a laboratory function as it's committed to the development of art and culture. And with Hello Laboratory series, we invite speakers from cultural centers around the world that, like CCBT, have many functions of a lab and ask ourselves so what is the lab in the first place and what does the existing of lab change and extend arts and culture? And what role does it play in the realization of CCBT's mission of civic creativity? When opening the volume two, we have set the theme of this volume as cultural hubs of the world responding to the times. And including CCBT, many of the cultural centers that have lab as their activities are based on historical background and time. It's been established in response to expectation of the experimentation and exploration of expression, which is to respond to urban issues. On the other hand, the discoveries and proposals to address the challenge we face are also something we would like to know, and the times are changing. And as a system, in order for the laboratory to be functional, the laboratory must be understanding the shape of time, and we have to be renewing ourselves and responding to the new changes. In today's symposium, in today's, we have invited three cultural centers that have continued this continuous change and respond to the times from their establishment to the present day. So by art and science, from America, San Francisco, we have Exploratorium, who are advocate of transforming learning through art and science. And from Hedital, we have performing arts in the hybrid era in Dresden, Germany. And we have Agro Labs from Indonesia. They are working in curatorial collaborative collective. And they work without a base. And we have CCBT. So let me introduce uh, the speakers from each of the hubs from Exploratorium. Tinkering Studio Learning Designer, Ms. Ryoko Matsumoto, and Ms. Birute Sonnenberg of the European Center for the Arts in Herrera, Jung Ok Jung San, Director of Alco Labs, and from CCBT, uh, this is a Technical Director, Mr. Ito, and uh, this is Hirota Humi uh, from CCBT. And we have a very international people working today and speaking together. So today, through this meeting, I would like to deepen our discussion about the future of art and cultural center that we experiment in order to be a step ahead and propose new things, which is a future that lies just beyond our doorstep. In the first, we would like to have presentations from the presenters, and the second part will be a panel discussion, and we are expecting some QA from the floor as well. And we have this QR code. Through this QR code, please pose your question. Today we have movies and cameras coming in at the loo. Therefore, if you do not want to be in within the venue or the, uh, please let us know. And we would like to start the presentation from Ms. Matsumoto from Tinkering. Thank you for inviting me. My name is Ryoko Matsumoto from San Francisco. Exploratorium Museum of Science, Art, and 
human perception in San Francisco. I'm a learning designer there. So I'd like to spend 20 minutes or so to talk about our exploratorium and how we are dealing with science and art and its historical background. And I want to talk about my studio, Tinkering Studio, for about five minutes or so. So let me start my presentation. Is it okay? I will be speaking in Japanese. So the title, Exploratorium, is hard to pronounce. It is explore, exploration, and orium suffix uh, is really meaning a space to do something. So it is a place for exploration. That is the meaning of the exploratorium. exploratorium. And we also say this is Museum of Science, Art, and Human Perception. So science, art, and human perception, these are the themes for our museum. So Exploratorium is more than just a simple museum. It is a kind of learning laboratory, experimenting ways of engaging people children and adults of all ages learning about science and art and human perception. We've done this for close to 50 uh, years. So it is really a learning laboratory. Scientific phenomena, artistic installations, the visitors can experience these directly. We have been able to develop hundreds of exhibits and educational programs as a way of offering these uh, direct experiences to visitors. So today it is the Interactive Science Museum. There are many science museums like this, but in 1960s, when this museum was built, this was unprecedented because traditional museums are based on collections. Treasures were displayed in glass cases, no way touching those objects. So it's basically displaying the history or the outcome of scientific research or outcomes of research. Having said that, our exploratorium is completely different from those traditional museums. We show collections of ideas. We are a museum of offering experiences. In 1970s, as you can see, this is the exploratorium floor. There is no you can see the objects are everywhere, scattered everywhere. So interactive, meaning that you can press the button and movement start. It's not just that. The visitors can actually play with the displayed object, get surprised, and share experiences with other visitors. They can also compare with others. So as you walk through the floor, you would hear the voices of surprises and excitement. So that was quite new back then. And it's not just that. It's not just high-tech technology of physics. There are a lot of uh, physical phenomena that people experience in their daily lives light, color, and sound. And at the same time, perceptions has been the theme of many displays. You can see, you can listen by seeing and hearing. How do we perceive the whole world? How that perception is related to physical phenomena? That is the important part of our display. Citizens, they're all interested in light, sound, and color. And at the same time, they are interested in how they perceive color, light, and sound. So there are a lot of different sound and color-related displays. In the beginning, the first curator said that exploratorium, people come to discover themselves rather than learning the historical no facts. So the internal world and perception, the internal world are actually married, merged together. And that is the reason why Exploratorium was able to grow rapidly in San Francisco. 
So this is based on hands-on display. This is one of the major characteristics of Exploratorium. So they get broken because people touch them. That is why we have machine shop in the center of the floor. The large space of workshop, everything that is displayed here is made here. At the very beginning, when we founded this museum, as you can see, there are display spaces in the background. They are connected on the same floor. This is the current workshop. We have the same value. The heart of the museum is this workshop. So there is a little fence that separate the workshop from the general area, but visitors can actually come close to the workshop and see the craftsmen are making objects. Let me show you the video. ごちゃごちゃしていますけれども、お互いにはあんまり意見をやることはありません。で、このショップの上の下の他のいいところだと思っています。ショップポイントの担当者がいて。私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私
uh, become a physics teacher at high school. And he found no equipment, no tools available at school. So he procured springs and car parts from a junkyard. And together with the high school students, he created experimental devices. And that ended up in the library of experimental devices and machines. And then this school started to uh, win the science fair competition every year, and this reputation spread and actually returned back to university. But then by that time, he had already discovered he was more interested in teaching rather than research. When he was teaching at high school, he realized students are information rich, but experience poor. He thought this was a problem. So at the Colorado University, he had a physics lab. He introduced a new way of teaching physics. Opening this uh, experimental equipment or lab to students, he wanted to open this to wider members of the society. And this is really the starting idea of developing a museum, exploratorium. Am I doing okay? So in San Francisco, a few he was very lucky to find this real estate. In 1969 spring, this photo was taken. The San Francisco city built this uh, exposition uh, buildings, and they did not know exactly how to use this after that. And Frank made a proposal to the city and acquired the right to use this building. And the rent was only $1 per year. This was as wide as 30 uh, basketball courts. It's a very nicely located building. And for about 20 years, uh, Frank paid $1 every year as a rent. So the space was available. Along with his rent, he set up a uh, machine tool workshop. Since the, this was a vast area, he was not able to fill the space with object and display. So he contacted every friend, asking them to fill out the floor. So Mercury space capsule model from NASA, from Stanford University. He received a linear accelerator. He just wanted to fill the space. In the same year, on one hot summer, he left the building doors open, and locals wandered in and started playing with exhibits. Observing this, Frank said, I guess we are open. So, so this impromptu opening, I really like this story, and I believe this opening is very representative of the exploratorium ethos. Usually museum openings are grand affairs, meticulously planned with everything in place, celebrated with fanfare and festivities, but it's not like that, as I mentioned earlier. This echoes the prototype spirit that I mentioned earlier, not waiting for perfection, putting things out when they are ready enough. So it's opened. It's a huge building. The space was not filled. And there was the cybernetic serendipity show. So this was serendipity to Exploratorium as well. It really designed the future direction of the museum. As a father of media, this is very famous. This completely allied with Frank's vision. Technology and art are merged together. Computer, machine, sound machine, artists, composers, poets, everyone were together. Everything was displayed all together. Magnet TV, sidebands, these electronic displays, lights, reflections like kinetic sculpture. These are some of the displays there. Frank looked at this exhibition, and he realized that art and science are inseparable. 
light color sound artists. They are like scientists, he thought. They are explorers of the world. Scientists and artists both are great noticers of the world. They notice patterns and mechanisms that general public did not realize, and they were able to uh, put them into certain shapes and objects. So this exhibition was supposed to last six weeks. As a matter of fact, these displays stayed for two years at Exploratorium. So from the beginning, art and artists have been deeply involved. So from the beginning of the residence program, we had these displays in a science museum. Artists in residence is something completely new. Maybe today it's not uh, unusual, but back then this was completely new. Artists has different displayed equipment. If you could go to our website, you'll be able to see. I want to talk about the most influential artists. Artists in residence, very first artist in residence, Bob Miller. He is not a physicist, he is not an artist. He thinks that he is a natural philosopher. He knew that Exploratorium opened and he decided to introduce some painting, his uh, artwork, to Frank, and Frank just loved it. And he was invited as an artist. For 20 years, he stayed at Exploratorium. So there is a hall in the room. The sunlight comes through the hall, and this light will be directed to spectrum light. And this will be reflected on different surfaces, like mirror. And then you get this rainbow-colored patterns that will be shown on a large canvas screen. This is not seen on a cloudy day. So it's a live sun's painting. So artist in residence program started with this artist. For 20 years, he is a legend. Many different devices he came up with were all very popular at our exploratorium. And it's not just his displays, but what is most contribution, biggest contribution is walking tour, light walk. So let me introduce this. And I think you understand just by looking at this. So he is showing this uh, white board. To look at the light that's reaching the board. The light that comes through the holes in between the trees reaches the board and it's round because the holes in between the leaves act just like pinholes. So you get round images of the sun every place you got a hole in between the leaves. Well, if light is images, and shadows are blocking light. In some sense, then, shadows are really blocking images. And that does lead to some nice surprises. Let's go over and look at some shadows in the direct sunlight. Here we can use a board that has some different shaped holes. As we let the light go through the holes, each one of those spots of light resolves into a round image of the sun, independent of the shape of the hole. Here we got some diffuse white light again, like we had outside with the sunlight. But in this case, We've got cross-fluorescent tubes as our light source. Looks the same as it did outside, diffuse white light. But take a look, it's really different. Here's a hole in a panel. I pull that back, and we look at the light that goes through the hole and reaches the screen, and you can see that it's in the form of an image of the cross-fluorescent tubes. It's obviously the light going through that hole. If I put my finger over the hole, the image disappears. So if instead of a hole, I take this black dot and put the black dot out here where that hole was, this black dot is going to block the light that went through the hole. And sure enough, the shadow of this black dot is a missing image of the cross fluorescent tubes. With a grease pencil, I can put another little dot here on the panel. And we can see that that dot also blocks an image of the cross fluorescent. So the shadow of that dot puts a missing image. I put another dot here, we get another missing image. 
In fact, I can put so many, this turns just into a black opaque bar there. And the shadow that you can see is made up of a whole bunch of missing images of the cross fluorescent tube, just as the shadow of my finger would be. In fact, I could use the shadow of my finger. So every little part of my finger, my hand, my arm, anything that casts a shadow, each small part of that object is blocking an image of the light source. In this case, images of the cross fluorescent tubes. So you can see that the structure around the edge of the shadow gives you a lot of information about where the light is coming from. Don't you think it's great? So when I just saw this, it just blew my mind. So we, do, we did know about the pinhole even before that. So you have a hole and the light comes in. But what he was doing was working on negative pinhole using the acrylic sheet, not making holes, but it's not a positive pinhole, but he worked on a negative pinhole. And that is probably coming from the interest of sunlight himself. And he had noticed that from his inquiry. And we, citizens, are now able to be enjoying that because of his artwork. And I think that was a great big case. And other art and residence artists, if in the initial part, maybe if you have come to us, you might remember this. This is a big dish of wide by 50 feet. And then you can hear voices from the dishes. Uh, this uh, was made by Douglas Hollis, a Berkeley artist. And what we say well at exploratories is that five-year-old and the adult can enjoy at the same time. And such a piece is the best piece that we can exhibit at Exploratorium. I only have 10 minutes, so I will be very fast. And this is another case I would like to share. Uh, this is the eyes of the artist who has been contributing to the evolution of the art. In order to summarize, at the Exploratorium, the artwork's role is the exhibition of art and science that is connecting each other in order to appeal to the audiences. In that case, art is not an add-on, but it's a process of inquiry itself. So I just said that all these pieces blew my mart mind as said uh, the art and science will be bringing new experience a new door open to the audiences uh, therefore the art piece by the art and residence artist uh, these are a co-creation by the artists and the staffs too so it's not just that uh, the artist is working in a solitary state but then they come over to the lab exploratory Yum has an observatory and they have a machine shop to work together and when you go there there's welder and carpenter and educators and all other people who are working at the lab so along with all these experts uh, the artists who work in the artist in residence can have a discovery who can have an adventure and by that uh, he can go into his quest and this is Iwai Toshio. I think he is very much related to CCBT. In the 1990s, he came over as an artist in residence with ourselves, and he has created an art called A Well of Lights. And after that, he created Zotolobe, and it is still exhibited at the museum floor. It's very rigid and robust. It will never break and destroy it. And there's Nakaya Fumiko-san uh, making the fog bridge. And we also worked with Meiwa Denki personnel. Uh, Mr. Tosa has came over to us, and ha he had been showing performance art with us. Uh, this is Biolab, and we have called artists in order to work interactively, in order to appeal the audiences. And this is Tim Hunking. Hunking. So he comes from the UK and he's a filmmaker and he's a tinkerer and he's a scientist and he's a cartoonist and he's our long time friend for Exploratorium. So there's three uh, categories of artists who come to us. Uh, one is make something go soon back home. And the second category is that they stay with us and he will create something along with us. And the third type is just relative as Mr. Tim Hunkin. He comes back repetitively and will be collaborating with us a num number of times. 
And likewise, as Mr. Tim Honkin, we have been working with many artists and they have been contributing us so much. And lastly, taking the last five minutes, I would like to explain what I am doing. Uh, this is about the Tinkering Studio 2013. We were created and this Tinkering Studio embodies the Exploratorium's ethos of exploration, experimentation, and prototyping. So we're not just limited to exploration, experimentation, and prototyping. Tinkering is to think by hand. We make something. And this is an approach for learning. And likewise, with the philosophy of exploratorium, using the ingredients, materials, and tools, and based on the people's experience, we'll be creating some artwork. And that's the approach. We use light and promote uh, PCs and motion controls, anything that is surrounding us. So we start from phenomenon or phenomena, which is very important for us. So. Why it is important is that people will be engaged into a various experience and then you feel the phenomena and then you get the feedback and that's going to be guiding your way through for your art process. And therefore, we are providing a various way for people to experience. And we ourselves work like a lab or lab, and the team itself is a lab. And within the lab, we always think how to engage ordinary people, the visitors, the auditors, in order to enjoy the experiment. And we have been developing on many various development. We're all open source and sharing. Uh, this is a thing. Uh, so please visit our website, and you will understand what we do. Like play, a psychic board, and automatic ma matter, marble, and chain reactions. And those are all the uh, developed activity, and that could be performed in African school or Chinese after schools. And that is seen in a daily level. At Tinkering Studio, we have the creation of the exhibition art that is to be exhibited at the Exploratorium. This is the wind tube, and we have a fan underneath the transparent tube, and we create various substances, and by the wind coming from the machine, have many toys fly. And this is not about uh, the specific, so we used to be using the specific makers wind machine. However, at one time, it was not working well. And as an activity, it was not viable anymore. So we tried out various fans. However, all the fans stopped. And we had a resolution. It, we, it was something that we did not expect. So we call this a using an stroll. So we found out that when we put an Fan and we put on the straws, so we find out that the winds will be blowing out the stra uh, straws in a centrifugal way. And we found out that when the wind is blowing so linearly, we just got the tube off, and so we created a tubeless wind tube. And this is a prototype of creating such an exhibition. And when we only use one fan, uh, the wind is so soft, therefore we use three fans and then put in uh, the straws in such a way. And then when the team find out that we have enough fan, we will start flying objects. And we always think about how the objects will fly or how much quantity of wind is needed or what kind of a materials that we fly will be engaging much more people. And it's not just a team, but the volunteers, the high schoolers will be engaged at the uh, process. And those people coming over to just visit us want to try out everything. And now this is a version which is now installed at the floor. Of course, uh, the the fixed one, the completed ones, we are already trying to show the straws there. We want to show the honesty of the materials that we use. And this is what Tinkering Studio does, meaning that we would like to have people understand the phenomena that goes around themselves and surround themselves. We're an education group. 
So we would like to have people understand the phenomena they are surrounded around, and we want to make an tinkerable activity. That is why that is what we do every day. And there's no right or wrong, but everybody wants to work on something that we would like to work on, and that is our aim. Coming back to prototype at Tinkering Lab, as indicated, we are creating prototype every day. And whether it be exhibition or activity, everything is perpetually prototype. So we are always um, trying to exhibit our best. And then if a next one comes, we replace. And we also work on full-scale prototype. It's not that we're going to be communicating with idea or words, but based on a framework, best form a real thing, we would like to create a full-scale prototype in order for people to understand. So these two concepts are something that we cherish. And what we also cherish is, it's summarized here within this one slide, what we say in the team is, we just experiment. And then we always think, what happens if? So these two words are heard every day. And the culture of the team is that we always embrace sharing of half-baked ideas. It doesn't have to be really completed. And sometimes we also have an embracing the quarter-baked ideas. So idea will be in between us and evolve in between us. So it's not somebody's idea, but then idea exists within ourselves, in between us, and then we roll out themselves and it evolves. So when we look back, uh, the good idea really comes in and we don't really know who was the generator of the idea. Everybody chips in and starts working on their hands to create an art. So it's really relevant of everybody that is participating. And underneath the line, this is a cycle of our development. So it means that we are always looking at the phenomena and the material. Therefore, we are always iteratively uh, making communications. And then our discovery or our quest to wanting to know things will be guided and we get feedbacks, which is a very lucky thing. And from here after, we get feedbacks from the visitors. And that is also going to be feeding into a further development. So every day we go through this circulation in order to do our development. Lastly, uh, this is a word from Frank, and this is a mission for the Exploratorium. And the word is, the whole point of the Exploratorium is to make it possible for people to believe. So I wrote this word, believe, in red. So the, what I want to say here is that it is very important for people to be able to believe that they understand the world around them. So it's not that important to understand the concept, but we need for us, for people to be able to believe that they can understand the world around them. So they need confidence. So whether it be exploratorium or tinker lab, the mission that we have is to nurture such confidence within these people and under these belief, we would like to work on various activities and programs and develop exhibition. With that, I would like to close my presentation. Thank you so much. So I would like to have a question. Have you ever visited Exploratorium? Please raise your hand if you have. Anyone who knew about us, Exploratorium? Thank you so much. That's impressive. It's very rare for me to introduce Exploratorium in Japanese, so thank you so much for this offer. So great round of applause to Matsumoto-sen. Thank you so much for the presentation. I would like the QR code up in the front, and from here on, we are now wanting to collect your feedback. It could be your question as well. And next. Next from Germany, 
Uh, we would like to call Ms. Birte Sonnenberg from Hellelau, a European Center for the Art. So Hellelau is working on a theater that was created in 1911, and now it is uh, one of the modern art center currently. And the context is that in 2022, uh, they are now working on the new festival seed a hybrid seal, so they are working on some issues, very new, uh, very exploratory. Hello. <laughs> all right. Um, hello. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank CCBT for the honorable invitation. Thank you. Uh, and also the opportunity to speak to you today here and uh, later talk in the discussion. Um, I'm uh, Birte Sonnenberg, part of the program team at Hellerau European Center for the Arts. And uh, just to give you a brief introduction on the whereabouts, um, so Hellerau uh, European Center for the Arts is a production house situated in Dresden, that's in the far east of Germany, in a rather re residential site, so not in the city center. Um, we are since 2004 a stage by the city of Dresden, and we are a production house, so we are no repertoire theater having a fixed ensemble, but we work uh, interdisciplinarily with dance, music, theater, performance, but also visual and media arts. And our program, for our program, we collaborate with a lot of other cultural partners from the city of Dresden and Saxony, the region, uh, but also nationally and internationally. And for this, we are also involved in numerous networks, uh, such as the alliances of the international production houses, that is kind of alliance of the seven biggest production houses in Germany. Uh, and we are also a part of uh, other long-term projects, such as Explore Dance, that is a network for um, younger audiences to get in touch and promoting dance. Um, also, we have a um, wide residency program that we run, and we are also part of uh, numerous residency networks. Uh, and to give you a little size of the house, so you just saw it here, I'll go back. Um, we are around 50 people running this house, and we have around 250 events a year with around 40,000 visitors to our program. Um, we have seven venues in the house and on two side angles. Um, and we have also um, an outside area that I will show you later. It's a garden and a temporary um, venue that is the hybrid box. I will also speak about that one in a minute. Um, so I myself am part of the program team. Um, I closely work together with the two directors that is uh, the one for dance and music and another one for um, media and arts. Um, and before I dive a little deeper into our program, I think it's quite important to also touch a little bit about on the history of Hellerau because the idea of a laboratory and a place to explore is actually inscribed into its very cure of the founding idea, a little bit as we just heard with the explanatorium. Um, so, let's come over here. So, um, the myth about Hellerau was fed on the visions of the craftsman uh, Karl Schmidt. Uh, he was a furniture maker, but uh, he was also a social reformer and created the first German garden city uh, in the Hellerau. Um, and on the highest point of the garden city, there was not a church, but there was a temple for the arts. And the architect of this house was um, Tessino, and he designed uh, a Festspiel house uh, that served as the intellectual and cultural center of the Garden City, following the idea of the triad of the Lebensreformbewegung. So the parallelity of work, life, and art in a space in one, in one place. 
Um, and Helle Rao translated the vision of the state designer Adolfo Appiah and the music teacher um, Dal Jack Dalcross into a spatial structure uh, whose symmetrical clarity and functional structure set the tone of modernism and is still today way before Bauhaus, actually. Um, so what was special about this place was that it had a rectangular orchestra print a freely installed stage um, without any elements or fixed rows for the audience. Um, there was no permanent fitting, so neither a stage nor curtains, um, making it into kind of an empty space ready to be played with. Um, and particularly fascinating about the, the Festspielhaus was the lightning concept by Alexander von Salzmann. So the ceilings and walls were lined with a uh, white wax cloth. Behind that were a thousand light bulbs and that illuminated a room that was kind of immaterial and indefinite in light and fed a room that was kind of erased of any uh, naturalism, bathing it in a kind of transcendent um, and uh, transparency. So what we would today call an immersive space. Um, same goes for the teaching that was quite revolutionary at that time. Um, so Jacques Dacros is one of the founding fathers of the rhythm or, or like the rhythm dance in, in Germany. Um, and, and the center of his philosophy was the idea of the, hu the moved human. So the idea was that a person can exercise its rhythmic abilities um, and involving like a holistic idea of, of the human being where art, work, and life all come together, a person that is not only knowing but also feeling. So this is quite radical for the modern dance or for the dance at, that, at these days and kind of um, starting to develop the modern dance. And the uh, institute uh, quickly became a success and students from all over the world were coming to Dresden to study there. Among them was also the young Mary Wickman, who later continued uh, the teaching of Jacques Dardcross and uh, became also a teacher of Great Palocca, today names that are kind of inscribed into the history of modern dance. Um, so Hellerau became this beacon and the center of uh, European avant-garde with every name you know, traveling to Hellerau, spending some time there. But the history of Hellerau is also quite um, uh, fixed and uh, also named together with the history of Germany and also Europe at that time. So the golden ages of Hellerau, I'll quickly, sorry, I missed these two for you to get a kind of impression. So that's the Great Hall. Um, <clears throat> but the golden years of the Institute only lasted for three years. Um, with the sudden death of one of the prominent figures and Jacques Dacross and also Adolphe Appiah never returned uh, to Hellerau after 1914 and then the First World War broke up, the students left the institute, and um, teaching came to an hold at these days. Um, and then there was the question of actually what to do with the building, and uh, when the Nazis came into power, they were first of all considering of turning Hellerau into a Festspielhaus for film back in these days, um, but that did not last it long, and in 38, Hellerau was converted into a police school, a boarding house that, and into a police school, and the boarding houses were torn down and demolished and replaced by military barracks. Um, there's very few known about this year, and we're currently taking research on what actually happened there. What we know is that the policemen that were educated there were then sent to the eastern parts. Uh, uh, and were also involved in death squads. Um, there's a first research to be published next March, and we're looking forward to have these final and dark chapter um, uh, to be opened. 
Um, after 45, the Festspielhaus then came into another military use by the Red Army, so the Soviet soldiers moved in and was turned into a hospital, and later the barracks, uh, and, and later served uh, as a gymnasium for paratroopers, and the barracks where uh, soldiers were stationed at these days. So over 50 years of, uh, it's over 100 years uh, existence, this house was not a house for the arts, nor was it in public use, but it was used for military means. Um, and this also kind of depicts the state of the house after uh, the fall of the wall. This is in 1990, when the first and the premises were first accessible again, and the house was in a horrible state. But the early 90s, in the early 90s, a few initiatives were founded and began the cultural revival of the state. Um, and the Feshbe House and surrounding buildings, although they were in a horrible state, quickly people started to work again in these. Um, so at the first phase, uh, when the cultural reappropriation was taking place, it was parallel to the immediate repair of the building and one could even say that um, structural and artistic activities at that time um, were kind of going hand in hand. Um, and what was particularly interesting about these years is that they were like the artistics and artists um, working there were all kind of dealing with the house and the history of it. So they took it as an immediate or source and material. Um, sadly, also, there's very few known about these years. Um, but there were three rather big festivals taking place. Um, I'll show you this one here. Um, so there are very, very few pictures, but uh, I'll show you these two in a minute, uh, these few in a minute. Um, and also in 96, there was the Theater der Welt Festival, um, which is a very renowned festival for theater in Germany and uh, abroad. Uh, and this was the first time that an edition of this festival was actually held in the former East uh, Germany. Um, so what is also quite important to say is that in these years, they were also falling into a time of great transition in the former GDR and an artistic and creative scene that let long had worked under a stressed and quite suppressive environment. So Hellerau became a ventile and a space where new forms could be experimented. Uh, but also in these years, discussions started around the question of the reconstruction of the house and the future purpose. Uh, and some part of the curational team back then that worked as a collective um, argued that uh, as the Feshbe House was a high-tech art venue in the beginning of the 20th century, a hundred years later, it would only be true to its heritage um, that the future profile would be that of a, la a laboratory and a place for arts and media. So there was a summer academy taking place in these years, um, and uh, the revival of the area also involved in the settlement of institutions and initiatives on the site, so it became more vivid, uh, such as the Signet Art Festival that uh, took place there, and also the supporting association, the Transmedia Academy that settled on the site, as well as the Dresden Center for the Contemporary Music. Um, and from 2000 onward, the Signet Art Festival also took place at the Festspiel House. Um, the Signet Art, I'm not sure if you're aware, it's a festival that took place from the 2000 until 2000, and is still running, but was at our space for until 2017, and is along with um, the Ars Electronica and the Center for Art and Media Technology in Karlsruhe and the Transmediale in Berlin, one of the most important festivals for digital arts in the German-speaking region. Um, but the idea of Hellerau as a solely laboratory for the arts and media did not succeed. 
And uh, the 1990s uh, also ended with a long and vivid discussion around the future of the profile of the house. Uh, and the plans of restoration emerged and, favor and these favored a focus as a production house and a venue for live performances. So in 2002, uh, the Dresden Center for Contemporary Music moved to the Festspielhaus and was in 2004 renamed into Hellerau European Center for the Arts. Uh, restorations are still taking uh, place up until today, but I'm going to give you a little tour of the house, the empty house. <laughs> so this is an, again the outside. Um, that is the Great Hall and two of our um, studio stages. One is used as our kind of lobby. Uh, that is the west wing of the, um, the former barrack, the former western barrack. That's where we work and there's the visitor center. Um, that's the garden I already t told you about that's behind the Festspielhaus that we also use for our programming. And this here is yet to come, so that's the former East Wing that is still under construction, and we hope to open it next year, 2000, in the season 2004-2005. Um, so the current cultural approach, I want to tell you a little bit about that. So we are collaborating with the local, national, and international performing arts scene, uh, and we are developing um, and hosting uh, our own format, series, and festivals. And that is, I'll give you a little tour around that in a few seconds. Um, we also focus on uh, kind of thematic spotlights. So we have a strong focus on the Eastern European countries and our neighbors. Uh, we are also um, always interplaying and also trying to um, keep up the heritage and the idea of experiment and tradition at our house. And we also have um, a strong focus on and digital, societal and ecological transformation processes that always find um, a spot in our program. And we are host to the Dresden Frankfurt Dance Company, formerly known as the Forsyth Company, um, that has been our uh, company in residence since 2005. Um, also, we have a quite extensive outreach program, probably not that of a museum, but we give our best. And uh, we also have, as I just already said, uh, international residency program. Um, if I have the time, I'll also give you a little tour of that. Um, to give you an impression of our last few years, I selected some of our uh, posters uh, for the performances. So this was the last season opening with uh, Marco da Silva Ferreira and the uh, piece Carcassa. Um, this is from a festival that we've been doing for the last few years. That's biannual. Um, it's called Erbstücke, that means heritage. Um, and for this edition, or last, this year's edition, we uh, had a focus on uh, southeastern Asia and also the east of Germany. Uh, another festival that we have also biannual is the Watch Out Festival, a festival uh, that is kind of uh, intergenerational for younger and older audiences. Um, we are also host to the um, Dresden, uh, Dresdner Tage der Zeitgenössischen Musik, so the Festival for Contemporary Music uh, in Dresden. And this is uh, from the 2002 edition of Nebenan, which means next to, that's a festival where we look Eastern. Uh, it has two predecessors, that was a festival on Russia and a festival on Poland, where we look to our neighbors and those performing art scenes that are under distress. Uh, this edition in 2002 was um, after the bribed elections in Belarus. Um, this year's edition was um, focusing on Ukrainian art. Uh, and next March we will have a focus on Hungary. 
Um, this is a quite lovely example of our kind of programming towards also our heritage and exploration. This was a reconstruction of the Appiah stage so that you also have an impression how that actually looked like. Um, it was a festival that already happened 2017, um, and this is from the 2019 edition, so the, the Appia stage, as the festival name says, was reloaded. That was for the 100th uh, university, uh, 100th birthday of uh, celebration of the Bauhaus. Um, this is another example that we had uh, a festival in 2020 called Work, Work, Work um, for, the, um, Dresd, uh, for the Saxony year of the in industrial culture. Um, because the region where we are situated is quite, uh, quite known and quite... Uh, how you say, was quite known for, for the mines and these are slowly closing and uh, so there uh, we were focusing on the transformation of work uh, and this is another festival that is kind of dealing with the um, outcome of these uh, years. That's the cool down festival focusing on um, the ecological aspects. So, um, Next, and the last 10 minutes that I have, is I want to give you also a little tour uh, around the importance and the role uh, media arts play in Hellerau. So we developed um, a platform, so to, so to say, uh, called Hybrid. And with this platform, we want to also um, kind of, how you say, um, remember the heritage of Hellerau in the beginning of the 20th century. And we want to establish an international platform, a laboratory, and an experimental as well as discursive space for the arts in, let's say, post, uh, in brackets, digital age and critical phase of these transformation processes that are taking place. Um, and we are driven by the interest in the ways and forms of communication and how art is actually communicated to an audience and the question of how this or these audiences can actually uh, assemble, so analogously or digital or, in this sense, hybrid. Um, so hybrid wants to address the technological but also the political and ecological dimensions of these transformation processes that are at stake. Um, and we've uh, developed this platform uh, already, or started to develop it already in 2019, um, so way before the pandemic, but we didn't know that it would come in hybrid as such becomes a term that we can't now get rid of. Um, so the first edition was the Cutting Edge Canada Festival that we did in collaboration with uh, Mutech. It was a four-day festival supposed to take place in 2020, but then being postponed to 2021. And it was also the launch of the hybrid uh, festival and the hybrid platform. Um, it was an audiovisual performance and uh, on a virtu virtual stage. Uh, and an inter uh, interactive gallery and a listening room with non-stop program uh, from the archive of the Mutech uh, Festival in Montreal. Uh, and we also opened the hybrid box. Um, so the hybrid box is really a box. You saw it in the front of the Festspielhaus. It's two um, shipping containers that we came up with to also mirror the construction process that is taking still place at our premises. Um, and on the one hand, we have the hard con construction, and on the other side, we um, kind of opened this modular art gallery being um, solely dedicated to uh, experimental and interdisciplinary positions in the field of digital arts. And we curate this together with Pylon, the Dresden-based platform for interdisciplinary and media art. Um, and this is intentionally thought of as a temporary space. So we will move out 
um, the hybrid box in the beginning of next year in February, and it will move downtown to the city uh, and will become a um, pop-up gallery. And the box itself will be restored somewhere, um, but there will also be another pop-up uh, gallery taking uh, shape in Rotterdam next year. Um, there is another festival that then came in October 2021, that's Hybrid Play, that's a reality check, where we actually did a reality check on theatre and how theatre is today dealing with uh, the digital transformation processes. Um, we did that together with uh, some other um, collaborators that you can see down there, um, both nationally, internationally, and also from the region. This is going somewhere. So, um, And then last year, we had the first edition of the hybrid Biennale, so we decided to... Um, so we decided to transform hybrid into uh, a biennial. Um, and that was a 10-day festival taking place in October. And we were presenting artistic uh, positions at the interface between analog and digital, as well as performing and visual arts. Um, and uh, where installations and performances were supposed to intertwine with the audience. Um, so that was the... The idea of this festival being uh, curated by Yasmin Keskentepe um, with the title Beyond These Fractured Presence. So it was supposed to be uh, not a linear event, but something stretching throughout the whole, um, <laughs> throughout the whole building. Um, um, exactly. So what else? Yeah. Um, that's an impression from that, from the last uh, hybrid Biennale. That's Choika Fai and digital feminism. But we also want to establish hybrid as a platform, as I said, so we, all, we try to also incorporate it into our stage program. Uh, and that is an example of uh, a piece taking place in March. It's called Opera, a future game that was actually supposed to be an opera but then due to COVID and uh, also a change of artistic direction, the opera never had its premiere. It became a video game essay. And this game was played in Hellerau in our great hall. Uh, and we had kind of a Twitch game there. Um, the other one is from also from November, so last, last month. Um, we had a, a piece by uh, Brigitte Mundendorf, uh, Orbit, a war series, uh, that was um, premiered at the Biennale uh, for music in Venice. And it was a 3D audio concert taking place in our um, great hall. Um, I have to, I only have three minutes left, so I'll just say a little bit about the next edition of the Hybrid Biennale taking place in 2024 with the working title Black Box White Cube XR. So we really now want to go back to the space and see where theatre uh, might also take place in the future. It will be mainly a symposium um, focusing on new spaces for music and performing arts. Uh, and we want to, um, yeah, kind of critically question the relationship between center and periphery and the ecological dimensions, but also the accessibility uh, for the audience. And um, yes, this for that. I'll just um, say two, three last sentences about our residency program. So we have around 100 residencies a year in our house and we have the great opportunity to actually also host them. We have 10 um, apartments that they can work uh, and live. Uh, we have several uh, studios that they can use. Um, and the yeah, they can stay from one week up until two months. And that's the last slide and then I'm ready to go.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to invite Ms. Jong Ok Jan, please. Please get prepared. Our Collapse Director Jong Ok Jan from Indonesia. In 2014, our Collapse was established. This is independent curator centered lab. After COVID 19, they decided to have no physical base. Interdisciplinary collaboration has been the focus. It's very open and flexible. So inside and outside the country, it has played a very important role in Indonesian art scene. So please, when you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning and good evening to those who are in the other parts of the world. I'm Jongwook John, and I'm from Arcolabs Indonesia. Uh, I'm very honored to be here to speak about how Arcolab has been a laboratory that fosters exploration, curation, and also empowerment for our society in Indonesia. So Arcolabs began its curatorial practices in 2014 as the Center for Art and Community Management within Surya University, which aims to enhance creativity and innovation through a variety of practice-based programs. In 2016, Arcolabs became independent of the university and focused on curatorial education programs curatorial education programs and also promote interdisciplinary interactions and international exchanges through its art and technology programs. Currently, Arc Labs focuses on developing and experimenting numerous curating methods for media art projects uh, through an incubation program and also participating in developing equal access of media art across Indonesia. So today, I'm going to talk three topics. First, I will briefly discuss the earlier community development project that we conducted within a traditional market in Jakarta. And second, I will focus on Arcolab's main concentration of media art projects and how uh, those projects explore various themes and aesthetics and um, how those projects also pursue interdisciplinary approaches and how those projects promote a new audience role. Third, I will discuss the two most current projects related to curator education and media art community festival. So in 2014, Arcolabs opened Space Gallery Pasar in Santa Market, one of the traditional markets in South Jakarta as part of our community development project and research. It was the time when the market community was struggling being deserted for the past seven years because two thirds of the units became empty. So our goal was to encourage equal access to the arts and culture appreciation in everyday life by the market community and also contribute to revitalizing the traditional market to become a cultural space which can attract more people. Our physical space is approximately 2.5 by 3 meters, surrounded by ordinary shops selling clothing and shoes. And we invited artists to challenge the limitation of our physical space while maximizing uh, the impact of their work of art to the market community. One of the examples is Powder Room, a solo exhibition of Tamara Pertamina, uh, who staged the gallery as if a dressing room of high end luxury shop. But in fact, the dress was made of uh, industrial rope and plastic yarn that are easily found in the market. Our curatory method was based on open call for young artists, so we provide a mentoring process. It was a very fine contemporary art gallery, so we try to acknowledge the role of art in a society that promotes a sense of coexistence with many different communities. And some other examples, 
includes a performance art and live sculpture by Calvin on upper left and floor shop by Edita on bottom left. This floor shop exhibition is worth to note because we found a quite number of children reside in the markets because they come with their parents who are the shop owners, but all day long, there were nothing much for them to do. So we invited the market children to participate in a, a hands-on workshop. The one on the uh, bottom right shows a print exhibition by Grafis Huruhara, who invited the artists to bring their own stuff to exchange with their prints. And one most relevant project to our goal of community development in the video is a performance piece by Hario Hutomo. He invited the market community to participate and organize in the SEC race competition. Um, held in the basement of the building. When the performance video was presented at the gallery space, all the contestants and the shop owners, they, they came and then they saw uh, they are in, in the video and they were really, really happy to be part of this artistic activity and gradually understand the, some unconventional aspects of contemporary arts. And after a year of the activities in the market gallery, Space moved to its new location and renamed Space Gallery Plus Workshop, which was operated for two years until 2017. And there, the gallery was constantly developing programs through collaborations with local art communities and also curators to support young artists with experimental practices. So to conclude this first topic, as the newcomer in the Indonesian art scene, we learn how to explore the notion of community, examine the right method of collaboration, and also understand the social role of art and culture in a specific time and place. While Art Collapse was doing our own community projects through our small venue, since our inception, we have already focused on curatorial practices associated with media arts, which was mostly done with many collabora collaborators and partnering institutions outside our venue. And there were more and more opportunities for us to work with partners for large-scale projects not only in Jakarta, but outside as well. Now I'd like to present a few examples of media art projects that we did uh, based, on, uh, based on three curatorial aims. Number one, uh, our project explore various themes and aesthetics. Number two, we pursue interdisciplinary approach. And number three, we promoted a new audience role through participation and interactivity. The, uh, the first, the th about the theme that we chose for our curatorial project, is various, um, uh, which includes uh, big data, nomadism, ecopolitics, artificial intelligence, and so forth. It was important for us to expand a thematic possibility that media art can express rather than merely demonstrating the technological impact of media to our society or just focus on the characteristic of media as a mere medium. Because by emphasizing the thematic relevance to our society, media art can be more accessible to the public because it is related to our life. This is a project called Visualizing the Invisible held in 2016 in conjunction with a big data, international big data conference. And I was invited as a curator and I chose media artists who presented a variety of perspective toward the idea of data. In fact, as AI becomes a very popular uh, trends right now, this exhibition can be a good start to think of uh, our dual roles. We as a data producer and also a data consumer and our AI driven future can be affected by the data we are producing right now. This is one of the examples in the show by Humph who demonstrated data from the photosynthesis process and Myun, a Korean artist duo, used real-time currency data to show a virtually animated landscape showing how closely we are connected and we affect to each other through currency. 
and Angelica Das from Spain uh, turn human skin color into Pantone color code, which becomes a human data, and none of us has the same color code. Uh, collective and collaborative uh, process in media art is important to ensure the success of a project, which is also why Arcolabs works uh, with many other curators collectively. We have full-time curator, we have project-based curator, we have curator with education expertise, and so forth. And if we have a project in local province, we invite the curator from the local city as an important team member. And collaboration is quite normal practice in media art not merely because of the complexity of the technological, uh, a technical knowledge of the constructing a work of art, but it is also because the benefit to conceptually deepen and technically expanding one's understanding of certain fields of study. Five Passages to the Future is the exhibition held in 2019, curated by five female curators with different expertise. Each of them proposed a different theme and also chose one artist as a pair. So this pair of curator artists collaboratively responded to numerous challenges in our society, such as artificial intelligence, eco-politics, sustainability, digital narrative, and wearable technology. The exhibition also invited five emerging Indonesian artists exploring the issue of eco-data. The artists tend to work together with experts of other fields, such as sound artists, fashion designer, robotists, programmers, and electronic engineers, among many others. The collaborative effort from each group resemble a logic of machines that requires cooperation of many different parts. Uh, the third curatory aim of our media art project is to develop a new audience role. The emergence of media art has made a significant change in the role of audience. Unlike in the traditional exhibition, the audience of media art exhibition became an active participant rather than passive viewer. The media art exhibition organized by Arc Labs focused on the new way of communication between a work of art and audience through the participatory and interactive uh, structure of the exhibition. For example, this exhibition is called Dialogue with the Senses, held in 2016, aimed to explore sensory experience and its significance in our life. The invited artists challenged the long-term privileging of sight in the appreciation of art and recover the power of all other physical senses that are equally valuable. So the present, uh, presentation stimulates not just the visual experience, but also hearing, touching, smelling, and tasting. For example, uh, Fazar Abadi on the left created a candle that stimulates a sense of longing for our hometown when we smell the, uh, when we smell the scent. And Chae Seok Young in the middle invited the visitors to create an image of sea animal, which becomes part of the projection video. And Park Sung Soon on the right uh, side uh, displayed bowls of water. And when we touch the water, we hear the sound of Indonesian traditional instrument, musical instrument called gamulan. So we become an active co-creator or co-musician. So to conclude this second topic, uh, I would say exploration of various thematic and aesthetic approaches helps the general public more familiar with media art in Indonesia. And with the aid of technology, media art requires a new process of curatorial framework, therefore more collaborations and exchanges between the curators are encouraged. And through participatory and interactive system of the exhibition, audience can become more active participants instead of passive spectators. Now, I'm going to discuss the two most current projects that we are working on. One is Curator Education Program, 
and the other one is a media art community festival. And I'd like to begin with a little bit of Indonesian media art context. So over the past 30 years, Indonesian media art has captured the attention of local and global audiences through a variety of curating methods, uh, including conventional gallery and museum exhibitions, hybrid festivals, laboratory experiments, public projects, and digital database, and online curation. It has gained general public visibility and recognition in the art world through diverse curatorial and also thematic approaches, which try to reflect the various concerns of current society, uh, encompassing social, political, and also technological issues. This slide shows an ongoing timeline of media art projects in Indonesia. Some projects are regular basis, but I mark only first year of the series, so there could be more than that. For example, OK Video started in 2003 and lasted until 2017 by annually. Jakarta International Video Work Festival started in 2005 and held annually until 2012. Sales button Jakarta International Media Art Festival from 2007 to 2011. New Substance started in 2007 and until 2012 as an annual event. I also marked the name of the city where each project was held to show the geographic dominance of the media arts in Indonesia. There are several interesting points to note in this development. During the 1990s, media art was part of curatorial narratives that aimed to introduce experimental artistic practices through installation, performance art, moving images, printmaking, and comics as a reaction to traditional Indonesian art forms such as painting and sculpture. In the 2000s, media-specific festivals were popular, such as Video Art Festival, which often criticized the way how state-owned mass media control power over the public's idea and behavior. From the late 2000s to early 2010, media art project attempted a greater focus on social, cultural, political issues using new and extended forms and media at the intersection of art, technology, and science. Since the mid-2010, media art has taken on a more specialized, diverse, and inclusive approach, addressing global issues such as big data, ecology, space exploration, the post-human, while emphasizing Indonesia's cultural and traditional practice. Despite such increasing interest in new media arts in Indonesia, there are limited exhibition professionals who specialize in curating new media art because education for media art curation has not been established in Indonesia. So in response to this absence of education for media art creator, Art Collapse developed Explore New Media Art Incubation, which was originally initiated as a mentorship program for artists, the young artists in 2000. 18, uh, and since 2021, this program has provided young Indonesian curators with lectures and mentorships to help develop their competencies in both the theoretical concepts and practical techniques. This competency development program is divided into five stages, orientation, lecture, presentation, curation, exhibition. And in 2023, this year, the program participants of Explore are from diverse locations, including Jogjakarta, Surakarta Central Java, Gresik East Java, and Kupang East Nusa Tenggara. And their purpose and interest differ from uh, each other as much as their uh, background. Each participant explores curatorial approaches uh, relevant to their own a local context while also adapting the rapidly changing exhibition landscape in the world. This is the view during the lecture program and due to various locations each participant comes from, we decide to use Zoom for the sessions. And the lecturer includes Suzu Tartanto, curator of National Gallery Indonesia, 
Nora Omuruchu, Artistic Director of Transmediale, Emiko Ogawa, Curator of Ars Electronica, Barbara Kiol Barsa, former Education Curator of Zeka M, and Paul Wilder, Curator of Neo Art. And the session include concept development, artwork selection, exhibition communication, and exhibition design. After the lecture program, the four Indonesian participants present their proposal to the mentor who give feedbacks based on which the participant can revise their proposal. And the revision of the proposal continue during curation process. We have four mentors from Indonesia who help enhance the project. The mentors include Suzu Tartanto, expert in blockchain and AI art, Bob Adrian, expert in sound art, Arman Arif, uh, expert in exhibition design, and Ninjani, expert in public program and communication. Last month, we just had the first outcome of Explore in Kupang, uh, East Nusa Tenggara, and the exhibition is about preserving and also revitalizing an important traditional musical instrument in East Nusa Tenggara through interactive media art. And this is curated by Ifana Tunga, who has a theology background and a member of a very active youth community in Kupang. Early this month, the, we had the second exhibition in Surakarta, Central Java, and the curator Johannes Brito, with a cultural studies background, engaged us in a discussion of the role of arts education and the absence of children in contemporary art. Last, last week, we had the third presentation in Yogyakarta, curated by Abinya, uh, Abiyya Gusti, who just graduated from her bachelor program in anthropology. And the exhibition shows how media arts become a very effective tool to preserve and archive our oral heritage. And next month, we are expecting to have the show from uh, Grasik East Java, and the curator will turn her project into an experimental laboratory. Uh, this is the last part of my uh, presentation. While we are developing curator education tailored to media art, we have, uh, we have also participated in the FKSM Festival, which is an initiative of the Indonesian government to promote Indonesian artistic practices using me new media and technology. And the festival started in 2015 in Bandung. And since 2017, it has been uh, in different cities across the country, including Pukambaru, Sumatra, Palu, Sulawesi, uh, Samarinda, Kalimantan. Uh, during these first three years, the festival was called Pekan Sini Media, which means uh, Media Art Week. It happens one week, and also it focuses on exhibition only. The festival ceased in 2020 and 2021 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but resumed in 2022 in Bungkulu, Sumatra, uh, under a new name, FKSM. And the goal, of, uh, goal is to introduce media and intermedia performing arts, focusing on activities by artist communities. Uh, this year, the festival was held in early September in the city of Mataram, Lombok Island. And this shows a map of FKSM and il illustrates the Indonesian government's effort in promoting media art beyond the culturally dominant Java island where you see uh, the, some letters in red. That's a small Java island, but most of art and culture happened at uh, island. But our, our festival goes outside the Java island. And this is a... This is a short video clip showing the event last year in Bunkulu, Sumatra. We can also have a little audio, uh, if possible. And the festival display works of media arts that celebrate Indonesia's diverse uh, ethnic knowledge by highlighting local wisdom and untold stories from the artist's place of origin or the host city. And this supports an educational experience of tangible and intangible uh, the heritage through media art. Okay. okay. I will move to the next slide. Yeah. For example, um, Puriwangan Studio uh, created 
Buriwanga Studio created a meditative space based on spiritual tradition of East Java. So it's a sound installation, and there is a water drops, and that represents the raindrops, because the rain is considered to be a blessing in Javanese uh, philosophy. And the sound of rain, it also can come, it has a calm effect on the brain. And the Gara Gara artist initiative uh, combines art and biology, and they create a laboratory inside the gallery space where audience can learn how to extract DNA, DNA from fruit, and also transform fruit to become a source of sound. And then the third one, uh, which is the community Lintas Suni, a group from Bunkulu. They never had an experience of media art, they said. So before the festival, uh, they participated in a workshop program. So they learned basic electronic art making using Arduino, sensor, light, sound. And this is their kinetic light installation based on the history of the linguistic tradition. Meantime, some, several installations take the local way of life as their main theme. So Waflap developed an interactive sound installation inspired by Indonesian street performers or buskers. And it's made of all recycled objects, plastic, bottles, bottle caps, gallons, and pipes. And this becomes a musical instrument and the audience can play. Uh, Indonesia, the advancement of technology also affects to buskers who recycle electronic waste to create musical instruments. So if you uh, walk along the street, when you see the buskers in Indonesia, you will see how creative and innovative they are. Okay, let me move to the... Next slide. And Shinao uh, Kinetic Suni, who presented their huge kinetic uh, installation outside the venue uh, in the open space. And then this has a two uh, objects, large objects, so inspired by Indonesia's maritime culture and spice, spice trade history. So the one uh, has a shape like a ship. Mm. Uh, and the other one has a movement of the waves. So the artist wants to, and also bamboo was important because it's very local materials that artists can find in Bunkulu. Um, this year, FKA SM is themed of Terra Dialectic and was held in Lombok. And the curators chose land as the main concept to encourage the artists to explore the ever evolving relation between humans and our environment. And land does not only provide physical resources, but it also becomes a cultural space uh, for human and also a place of conflict. And there are several characteristics of FKSM. First, knowledge exchange of both media art and creator process with a local participant. So when we, uh, when we prepare our curatorial uh, process, uh, we only limited number of the team uh, went to uh, the local city and we recruit everyone from the local because it's very impor important for us to learn the local way of doing and working. And also, we had a lot of collaborations between community-based artists and curators. And the, this festival emphasized the collaboration, uh, is the, especially the gotong royong, which means the cooperation, mutual cooperation, and very important philosophy of Indonesia. And prior to the festival this year, curators visited uh, Bali, Lombo, Kupang to socialize with local communities in order to foster collaboration between media artists and intermedia performance artists, sharing knowledge. And also we try to create an inclusive programming by ensuring that we have diverse representations of gender, multicultural background, regional diversity, and also intergenerational uh, range because all these efforts will help us build connectivity and synergy between communities across nations. So to conclude this third topic, uh, this festival represents the recent growth of media arts in Indonesia, 
not as a standard practice, but as an interesting aspect of its history. And also this festival can be a strategy model to foster the cultural values and local wisdom in Indonesia. Uh, as a conclusion, I'd like to say, as a lab-driven uh, initiative, iCollabs will continue to become a place for experimentation, research, innovation, where artists, scientists, technologists, and other professionals collaborate to create new forms of art, explore new uh, mediums, and also investigate new ideas to eventually contribute to our society. Thank you very much for your attention. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much. So from CCBT, technical director uh, Ito is now presenting. CCBT, uh, utilizing art and digital technology, promote people creativity, which we call civic creativity, which is the base for such activities. We have lab studios here where we can organize workshops and other programs through which we would like to start innovation here from Tokyo. Hello, I'm CCBT uh, Ito. Here at CCBT, I'm a technical director, basically chief direct, technical director, and this is how I would introduce myself. So I joined CCBT this August. Before that, I was in Yamaguchi City, YCAM. I was a director of Interlab a Research and uh, Development Team. Today I want to talk about CBT and also some of the activities that I was engaged at YCAM. Starting with Tokyo metropolitan area, the population in Tokyo is 14,000, but I did not know until recently. If you include the extended area around Tokyo, the population size is 38 million, so it's regarded as the largest mega city. Japan's population is 120,000, uh, 20 million, so about a quarter of that total population is here in Tokyo, meaning there are many people doing many different things. With regard to culture as well, we have all kinds of culture, alternative culture and major, major culture. So it's often described as a crucible. That's where CCBT was established. CCBT, through art and technology, wants to promote people's creativity for society. The Tokyo Metropolitan Government and Tokyo Metropolitan Foundation for History and Culture are operators of this. And this uh, hotel, this basement room was renovated to create CCBT in October last year. The background of this foundation is to create a facility for art and technology. We have lab and studios, there are many different programs from which we would like to become a creative engine to generate innovation here in Tokyo. And we call ourselves civic creative. We have artists, designers. Other than these, we want to invite general public to participate so that all of us will be creative artists. At the time we opened as one of the opening events, we organized future athletic meet in Tokyo. In the form of hackathon, we invited many participants. We all worked together to create sports contests, sports tools and devices. Newly developed race is organized. Everyone participated in the race, utilizing the devices and tools that you have never seen. And this really embodies the concept of CCBT. CCBT is co-creative transformation of Tokyo. We inspire, we co-create, we incubate, we network. In order to realize these four, we have art incubation, showcase camps, meet up, a workshop. We have five core programs, so let me introduce. First of all, art incubation program. Every year we have uh, open calls to invite the artists, we select them. Do we select artists, they become artists fellow. 10 million yen is given as 
a production budget. So it is the largest in Japan. When fellow period ends, artists will present their outcomes. But up until then, they have workshop, talks, lectures, and different production processes. These are five groups of fellows this year. Tim Brown uh, have a project to connect AI people and street walking. Syntrax focuses on digital fashion, metaverse. Contact Gonzo uh, is working on performing art with skin tactics senses. Snooze Love is trying to provide a relaxing environment for severely disabled people. Electronics Fantastico reforms home appliances to create electromagnetic musical instruments. As a matter of fact, these uh, music instruments and old home appliances are stored in our next door. And that's the room for Electronicos Fantastico. And they are going to organize open studio where everyone is invited. So if you are interested, please go to our website and check that out. I'd like to also introduce some of the outcomes of uh, last year's fellows. Asami-san, God Scorpion, and Yoshida Yama, they had a team to use AR and VR in Shibuya streets. From Tokyo, New York, and Berlin, we had 10 groups of artists. They go to Yoyogi Park, Scramble Crossing to display their AR, VR um, artworks. Kiara-san and Playful team, they are right there. They had deviation game. They developed deviation game. They actually publicized this in a workshop and exhibition. That is to create pictures humans recognize, but AI cannot recognize. That is a rule. The AI has learned the past data. But creating something completely new, AI would not be able to recognize that as a picture. So this gives us a hint to consider how humans should develop relationship with AI. And this is a photograph of exhibition where uh, this game is accessible to participants. Multiple people play in the game. The theme is uh, set and uh, players will uh, draw pictures. Pictures are not shared in the beginning. After these pictures are completed, AI and players together try to predict what the picture was all about. If you get it right, you can win over AI. I actually played this game. AI was much smarter than me. I wasn't able to beat AI. Having said that, when we had this display at CCBT, um, majority of the time, uh, humans uh, beat AI, not so much in uh, overseas areas because of uh, possibly the bias in different countries. The third group, this is Sitecore Road Rock, Vajana and the City. They use the underground space. There is the underground uh, reservoir. And this has been a theme. And also, they actually took the video of subway stations, which is no longer utilized, to create the virtual underground city. Now, this is displayed under the real road network, and this became a hot topic. It looks like many people came to watch. A second core program, this is the Media Art Exhibition. Its production process is also displayed. We had the exhibition twice this year in the very first exhibition in July. We had traditional media artist Toshio Iwai became a director. So the title is Playing with Eyesight, Playing with Your Eyes. In the exhibition, as you can see on the right hand side, fraction scope for the rope were actually utilized by the team. These traditional uh, animation equipment were recreated. And we were able to understand what gave Mr. Iwai an inspiration. In early work of Mr. Iwai, uh, this is a series of artworks. Three of them were actually repaired along with the author, the artist, for display. 
Oh, it was very big. We'll go to the Museum of Tokyo Photographic Museum. Sorry. The media art utilizes equipment, but it's very difficult to keep maintaining equipment. And this has become a very important issue globally, but we have experience of repairing this. Everything about our repair is now disclosed on our website. This exhibition was quite popular among children. The families came to visit and it has caught attention from artists and researchers as well. The third code program is called CAMP. Art and technology related creative activities in a very short workshop for five days. During the camp, there are a lot of lectures, technical workshop, group works where people share ideas, project demonstration. So this is the basic composition of the camp. We have volume two in August. The theme is creating new roles blockchain. Generative artist Shinsuke Takao became a program director. We talked about blockchain, money, NFT, in DAO. We had uh, experts in these areas, and 15 of them actually became facilitators. And blockchain technology has been impacting all aspects of the world. For these uh, five days, we actually wrote programs to try to use NFT so that we better understand the issues. We had 20 participants and teachers. They were working together uh, intensively. Even after the camp, uh, participants, some of them at least, came up with ideas, continued their projects. Next February, we are going to have the third camp, Inclusive Encounter Creative Workshop. At, uh, we are going to have uh, uh, Laila Kasemu as uh, Shibuya Font Art Director, and also Shinichiro Ito, who is a uh, researcher, is going to be a director as well. The fourth core program will be Meet Up and Talk and Lecture, and this event is part of that. Number five, this is a workshop series. Workshops, they are often related to showcase and incubation planning. We have many of them organized. So this is one of the workshop series too. They utilizing technology. Uh, we are to create in dojo to create some products. And CCPT, uh, we have some fabrication equipment. Therefore, using equipments, uh, people will be enjoying programming and designing. Next uh, January and February, it's going to be a biotechnology workshop. And we're going to be using the fold, fold scope using a Microsoft that is very inexpensive using some lenses and paper and using that microscope we're going to be observing slimes and molds ever since we have been open ccbt has been launching various core program and we have been counting 160 over uh, plannings and people coming over to us was 20,000 over since our opening and it's only one in a several months that we have been opened and this I was so surprised however uh, looking into the calculations in one time there were several multiple events overlapping therefore I think the number is right uh, but however just listening to Herrera uh, they have been saying that they have been launching 40,000 people audience coming in so I thought no we're normal we're not that so special and then I would like to share with you uh, the uh, story about the white camp not just the about ourselves at CCBT because the topic is about lab and Yamaguchi uh, y cam is located within the western part of the main island uh, this is called Yamaguchi Center for Arts and Media, and we have pro a planning and technical realization, and we have a YCAM Interlab team within the internal, and we also have the education program development, and there it is open for 20 years already. At the initial part, uh, the creation and exhibition of a large art piece has been the focal point. However, after 10 years, 15 years of opening, the museum is now much more engaged with the community, and it is now having a perspective, a perspective of a civic creative idea, just like CCBT. And YCAP has a very uh, much in equipment and 
has a large space, therefore they can handle a very large art. And this is Takata Nishiro and Sakamoto Ryuichi artist art work. And one line is about 1.2 meter size, and it is a box filled with water and it is hanging from the air and it has a projection up from the top and using the theatrical space of YCAM it has been exhibited and audiences looks at this water filled uh, box from below and there's many other that we have had exhibition so the one that I just explained was about life fluid invisible inaudible and this one is called without records and for the first 10 years we have been using and creating a very large installation however after 10 years now we are focusing much more on the people who engage with us especially the community starting 2015 every year many people coming over from in and out of the country we are engaging them in order to have a sports day it's just like i've been showing at the opening of the ccpt and this is a series that we call rolling series this is also exhibited but this one is about the children children could be remaking or reshaping the area by their idea in order for that to be done much more easily uh, this is a very uh, temporal park that is movable and very flexible and at that time there was no rule however uh, the spontaneous staffs has been um, showing up in the size of 70 people so it was so impressive and after 10 years of operation the project has also been including the expression about art this is a project called ram and using motion capture using and having the dancers movement within the data into the computer and then have that feed it up into another project for instance uh, the uh, body could be stick to the wall or else maybe the hand and the legs will be uh, replaced with the joints or else maybe the joints could be uh, used in small fractions and by seeing that the dancer will be also moving their bodies and with that, a new type of body sensation will be understood and new type of curation score will be found. So that is a kind of a, a topic using body and technology. And from Taiwan, UK, many um, people came in from domestic side in order to run the workshop. So the project of such uh, scientific ones, researchers, uh, the experimental one is so important and interesting is that we can engage people, not just the professionals, but the non-professionals as well. And this person that you see is Professor Kumagaya Shinichiro from Tokyo University. He has disorders and he is researching himself. And by the project using the system, he has been experimenting and he has been going through the experience as well. And through his uh, noticing, we were able to understand various things, and we learned many things from him too. And after 2015, the YCAM Bio Research Project was installed. We created a bio lab, and using biotechnology, the workshop has been developed. An art piece has been created. Uh, this one is also engaged with the citizens. So along with various people, we have been collecting the wild yeast. Yeast is created or found in order to bake breads. And a left-hand side, bottom, this is the experiment of inflating objects by the yeast. And you can see the most inflated one is coming from the yeast that we bought from the supermarket. We call that yeast an athlete. And anyhow, we have been collecting wild yeast and creating books from that or else started some baking shops or else go into the forest and find uh, DNA from the, some ingredients or else we already we also had a project with the bento shop and have them create a bento using ingredients that we have gone through researching the genetic info and around 2009 along with the ICAM work we have been working on with an American artist uh, who has been working on an iWriter open source gaze input machine. And this person has been a graffiti lead person. He was a legendary person. And he is called Tempt One. He is an artist. And after 2003, he has been sick with ALS. And 
the eye writer has been created, developed with the artist that has been uh, synchronizing and understanding the topic of the attempt one, creating this mechanism, which was only created with um, bricks and mortars using only one median yen. Uh, people were able to, or rather attempt one, will able to put in his data and move things from gaze input machine. And this one is actually uh, having a projection onto the wall, which, which attempt one has been creating, uh, putting in the gaze by his, uh, through his machine. And this uh, project had a very strong story, and it was topical. It has been uh, exhibited in Japan as well. It was also introduced in TV medias as well. I Rider is still an artist and currently works at the front line. And uh, this person that I would like to introduce is called Zach Lieberman. He is thinking that uh, creating the artist itself is like a research development at the lab. And if you come to think of this, any art piece could be going through uh, makings. And during that, we do the interventions, we do the experience. So I feel the same, si same thing too. And competence is a word used by uh, Saito Seiji of Panoramatics when we have been setting up the CCBT. The Minister of Taiwan, Digital Minister, uh, of Mr. Audrey, Ms. Audrey Tan, has been saying that literacy it should be used in order to handle digital and media area, not the word literacy, but he will be or she will be using the word competence. So it is about the competence of people who are handling the uh, ITs in media and digital area. So iWriter started from that we ourselves are the creator of what we want to create. And by having that start, we are able to resolve something. And I think this is a thought that we must uh, treasure. And this is a photograph that when I visited Exploratorium, so I would like to just mention about this. This is the entrance area. And as Matsumoto-san has made a comment about this, Exploratorium is like a warehouse. And it's a connected airspace. And the exhibition is created. And the repair is also being able to enjoy from the visitors. And within this space, there's many things clamped into the area. And there's many things that is exhibited. So you take a long time. And even I took a day around, I was not able to finish all the exhibition. And this one was very impressionist. So this is uh, to just. Um, measure your signal speed about your nerve system. So when you have some uh, band sticked onto your ankle, and if you have another band sticked onto your neck, and then when you just turn around the knob, you can see this person is uh, touching the knob. And when you are turning around the knob, the knock to your neck will be adjusted, and you can just change the timing of the knock to your neck, and then you will find the timing of the knock to your neck uh, coming down to the ankle. And at that time, it took 45 milli per second, uh, so it's about one millimeter per sec. Therefore, it's about three frames difference when a nerve will be uh, delivering your signals from near head to toes. This one is another interesting one. Uh, you can see uh, the strings making waves. Mm, if it's a slow motion, you can understand. And when you see it with your eyes, it's also interesting too. And a strong impression is what I got from this person. Uh, this person is a staff, Mr. Ron from Exploratorium. If he's still working, I think he's working there for 50 years or more. And he has been showing me around around the machine's job. And what he mentioned and stuck to me is that uh, there's a story, according to Mr. Ron, that embodies uh, the ideal of Exploratorium. So one day, an old lady came over to Exploratorium, and she went around the exhibition saying nothing and went back. But then she visited again the place, and she was so excited. She said that she was able to change the bulb, electric bulb, by herself. However, there was no exhibition about the light bulbs at all. So the story is that 
the old lady has been going through the exhibition and thought that the light bulb is rather related to her and she thought that she could change the light bulb by herself and that is the exact um, philosophy that exploratorium aims for is what Ron San said and this is the word future fluent and CCBT um, director Okawa San has been explaining CCBT using the word future and fluent so we are to be proactively be fluid and look into the future of whatever changes that we are to face going forward. And usually the word fluent could be used for how you are well fluent and proficient in a certain language. However, thinking that um, fluency will be acquired after various trial and errors, we as a people who create art, we will be able to create things through trial and error, and then try to create something that is hackable to the world. And that recognition is very important, is what I think. So anybody coming over to CCBT, looking at our activity, uh, participating within our activity, if people think that activity is fun uh, and invoking, I will be very much happy. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. So we had four speakers, Matsumoto san, Zoto san, and John san, and Ito san. We will close the first part for now, and we will have a break, a little less than 20 minutes. And at 5 to 6, we will start the discussion and Q&A session. So please stay on. We have QR code projected on the screen from which you can actually submit your questions and comments. Thank you.
claws, this one's for you. Tell me, sweet mama, what's a guy to do? I'm tired of pretending it's just who I am. Come on, Mrs. Claus, let me be your man. Awkward shaving, wear a cap on my head. By matching robes, all shiny and red. I'm begging you, please, I'll do all that I can. Come on, Mrs. Claus, let me be your man. Since I was a little boy I never cared much for all those toys You've always been the one for me My beautiful angel on top of the tree On Christmas Eve if you're feeling alone Go right ahead and pick up the phone Give me a call, I'll come quick as I can Oh come on Mrs. Claus, let me be your man This one's for you Tell me, sweet mama, what's I gotta do? I'm tired of pretending this is who I am Come on, Mrs. Claus, let me be your man Oh, Mrs. Claus, let me be your man
On the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a partridge in a pear tree. On the second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree. On the third day of Christmas, my true love gave to me three French hands, two turtle doves and a partridge. Christmas, my true love gave to me four calling birds, three French and two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. On the fifth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me five golden rings, four calling birds, three French and two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Christmas, my true love gave to me six keys to lane, five golden rings, four golden birds, three French hands, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. On the seventh day of Christmas, my true love gave to me seven swans of swimming, six keys to lane, five golden rings, four golden birds, three My true love gave to me nine ladies waiting, eight maids of milk, and seven swans of swimming, six geese of laying five golden rings, four calling birds, three French hands, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. On the tenth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me ten lords of leaping, nine ladies waiting, eight maids of milk, and seven swans of swimming, six. He's the lane, five golden rings, four calling birds, three French hands, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. On the eleventh day of Christmas, my true love gave to me, eleven pipers piping, ten lords of leaping, nine ladies waiting, eight maids of milking, seven swans of swimming, six geese the lane, five. My true love gave to me Twelve drummers drumming Eleven pipers piping Ten lords of leaping Nine ladies waiting Eight maids of milking Seven swans of swimming Six geese of rain Five golden rings Four golden birds Three French hands Two turtle doves And a partridge in a pear tree And a 
はい、お待たせいたしました。それでは。Thank you for waiting. We will like to begin the second part. We had so much information. We had four thirty minutes presentations. In this second part, we would like to review the presentations, and we've received comments and questions from the audience, mainly online. So we would like to deal with those questions as well. I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Shirota Hirota from CCBT. So, the very first presentation is by Matsumoto san from Exploratorium. In 1969, Exploratorium was established. They had idea collections, experience based museum. This is still relevant today, especially. Uh, visitors uh, try to, uh, they're encouraged to become uh, more confident. And we have a great embassy from CCBT Civic Creative. So it's a very useful case for us. At Helena, uh, Ms. Bilde made a presentation. It was in the beginning, Center of Avangarda. And they had a history of modern dance theater in 1992 and onward. They've done a lot of different things to reinstate a culture. And the theme we set up for this symposium, that is uh, art and love being flexible and applicable, and this is similar to this experience. So I have questions to Matsumoto-san and Bilder-san. 
uh, about residents. We talked about artists in residence. So starting with Matsumoto-san, how long is this program? Uh, do you have open calls? Do you select artists in residence? And so how long do you have open call? Do you select them? Artists in residence program, uh, we do not have open calls. We always have agenda set at our museum. So we are going to have exhibition on sound, for example, so that will be the agenda. And based on that set agenda, we try to find appropriate artists. So we have our own agenda. We try to find artists that are most suitable. How long would the program be? It depends on each program? Yes. I talked about three different kinds. Some will stay only one or two days. Well, maybe we can call that a uh, resident. But some people stay one year or two years. They may not be there all the time, but they keep accessing to the museum for, say, two years or one year. So it depends. Two years is quite long. Do you have international artists in residence as well? Yes. We actually invite many international artists. Some people are from within the country. It doesn't matter where they live. So they will play as a partner's role. So when you think of uh, qualities of artists, of course, it depends on the project. How do you select artists? So as a curator, how do you select artists? Well, it really depends on the project. Until a project starts, we don't know, because they are partners who we are working with to create something. So the artist, if artist has a strong idea of what he wants to create, it's very difficult to work with. But we have open space, so the artist who is flexible and accommodate their ideas, they will be more ideal partner for us to work with. It's easier to work uh, artists like that. So that will be one quality we look for. Thank you very much. At Helen as well, we have residence program. Likewise, how long would the program be? Do you have open calls? How do you select residents? Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, as I said, we have around 100 residents a year. But uh, for us, we don't have individual uh, residencies but they can also come in a group. Um, and we have some of our residents come via uh, open call. So we have uh, one open call that is uh, solely um, for the artist and residency, um, um, artist and garden residency, and that happens two times a year. And there can be either individual artists or also, thank you, also uh, artistic uh, groups. Uh, and this residency is uh, up until a month, yeah, one month. And then we have also residency, or the rest of our residency program is um, rather uh, closed in the sense that we also approach artists uh, that we work, want to work with or that we already work with and they are having a new production that they are working on. So these would be rather, rather the um, production residencies. Um, taking place and they can be from one week to up to two months so we have one residency program also together with the Conseil des Arts in uh, Montreal in Canada and this is uh, solely for uh, composites and that is for two months and then they stay at our uh, venue and can use the, the um, project rooms and also the rehearsal studios yeah Thank you very much. Uh, another question to Bill Desan. 
So you had hybrid series. Uh, you had since last year, we actually had biannual, biennale. Since last year, uh, the word hybrid, it deals not just technology, but it deals with political aspect and social aspects. So it deals with uh, diversity as well. And I think this is uh, partly due to Haley Lau's histor uh, history. But can you talk about the non-technical aspect of hybrid? The, so the word, the hybrid, can you, can you hear me? Hybrid, can you hear me? Hybrid is very much focused on, uh, for us, on the space. So we are still a venue dedicated to the performing arts. And we work, or our conception of Hellerau is really to working with the space and artists and approaches that deal, coming from the space and deal with technology and media arts. So, um, we don't have like an online platform. Some theaters also have in Germany, like the How Hebel am Ufa, they have a like an online stage solely for um, artists working in the digital sphere. But for us, it's really coming back to the space and um, focusing on that. Thank you. On the other hand, Alco Labs, Alco Labs. So we heard the presentation by Alco Labs. You do not have physical facilities. But you introduce experiments to media art. It's completely different from traditional art. And you also introduce in your presentation the Indonesian media art history. You contribute to society. You try to create innovation in society. This is quite similar to Japanese media art trend. So with that as a background, I would like to understand the Alco Labs focusing on education, curator education, which is a wonderful strategy. And Indonesian art scene is full of uh, inclusions and activities uh, for social goods, and which is widely known. And you had Explore or Instrumenta or FKSM. All of these trends are all in line with global media art trends. So the question is, what do you, um, what does the government or Indonesia expect out of media art? What is the expectation on media art from the perspective of Indonesian national government? Um, okay, so the question is, what is the expectation of the Indonesian government by having and supporting media art through FKSM? Um, as I said during the presentations, um, Indonesian media art has developed already like three decades. So when you remember the timelines that I shared to you guys, uh, it seems like it's a really like diversity and dynamics, uh, but uh, at the very beginning of this uh, development, actually there was no like government support at the beginning, so most of the media art projects were done by artist collectives. So interestingly, the artist collectives who use a video as a medium or other technology as their artistic create they decide to um, have, they decide to uh, create their own platforms to present. So they are like a forerunners to start this kind of uh, media art festivals and exhibition as, uh, as a development. Uh, but, but then later on, uh, like mid like 2015, government, I under, it's really my personal opinion, uh, that the government also saw the potentials, how media and technology can actually give uh, Indonesian artists like uh, more expanded possibilities for their creativities. And also uh, the young generations in Indonesia, if you go even very, very small villages, everybody uses smartphones and there are even the village that 
uh, they are making a lot of YouTubes. So the media and also the technology is quite uh, ordinary and very close to us, but not uh, media art. So I believe that there there found some kind of a gaps in there. So the government uh, started to support uh, through these kind of festivals and. Um, this FKA SM festival, the very uniqueness is the other Indonesia-based festivals are um, like uh, the run regularly in their own cities. So, uh, but because of, especially within the Java uh, Java Islands, uh, particularly in certain like few uh, major art and culture cities. But the government also found that uh, it's uh, it's very important for media art that has to be more accessible by the uh, general public. So uh, their expectations uh, through this um, festival uh, endeavors are uh, giving a more balanced development in media arts, even if it's a very small villages or small cities. Um, they can not just experience uh, by appreciating the work of art through the presentation, but also the, they can learn about how to organize, how to also facilitate this kind of festival. So I think that's what the Indonesian governments are expecting by supporting these festivals. Thank you very much. So the Civic Creative Base Tokyo is now aiming for media art, but rather more than that, we are intended and focused on how to focus uh, the media art, and that was very reverential. Thank you so much. It was so inspiring. And today, we're using the function Slido. Slido, um, you can come in from the QR code to come into our discussion point. And we already have some very important in discussion point. I will pick up a few and then present to you. All of the questions are about productions. So for Herera, Herera is a production facility. You have a core for production. However, you must be memorizing, storing this, and it's probably going to be very difficult for producing and storing, so for archiving and how to hand down all these intellects and tradition knowledges. How are you putting your practice on for storing? And can we start from Matsumoto-san, from Exploratorium? Let me confirm. So you mean about the documentation of what we create within our team? Yes. So it could be your team and it could be for general public. How are you going to be archiving all your works? Or else how are you going to be sharing your works? If you have any creativity in those, I would like to know. So it's also about tinkering studio and exploratorium also started with a big topic about open source and today I did not f touch upon. However, making the creation of our exhibition, we have a cookbook recipe book and other museum people. And so in order for us or other people from the museum will be able to make production and that's a publishment that we have been working at a very early Point. And regarding website, the Exploratorium website started from 1930. And yesterday, we just had a 30-year celebration. So it's 1993. We opened on December 17th. And this was the 600th www.net website among the whole world. And we were the very first at the museum that whole had a website in the whole world. So our activity and our know-hows and knowledge, our concept of sharing such knowledge is, is starting from the very early point. We're not thinking that we would want other people to follow suit, but everybody can work on their context. And then we in return could also learn from you. So that is how we share and that is what we expect people to do. Thank you very much. So what about you, Herrera? So I think you're performing art a center, therefore it could be difficult, but uh, if there's anything that you can share with us in terms of practice, please. 
I think that's already a definition of the art form itself, being rather fluid. And um, yeah, for us, it's as I said also in my presentation, there is some kind of lack of documentation, that's for sure. And that's especially for the early history of Hellerau and then uh, the time during the military use and also the early 90s, which is really sad that these years are so rarely documented. But um, what we do is we work today with a with an online uh, SharePoint that we use as a team. Uh, and there we store everything that kind of is sent to us. Uh, and of course, we are also documenting our performances, most of them with uh, photography and some also with video material or with video. So we have also a small video um, database uh, and also the years when Hederau was used as the center for uh, Dresden contemporary music, there is a quite excessive and extensive uh, archive. Um, so yeah, this is uh, the form we store things today. But we are actually also questioning this because there is a kind of a vivid discussion in the independent performing arts scene in Germany of actually, because it's such a rich tradition um, dating back for so many years that they um, launched last year the first archive to actually centrally collect these uh, developments and also the history of the independent performing arts scene in Germany. And we will soon have them at our house to also see what our contribution for this archive could actually be. Because, of course, there's also history written in our building and that should also be accessible to students and the greater public, of course. Yeah. John Oksan, John Oksan, please. Uh, speaking the archiving, our uh, projects, maybe I can talk about platform and also the way we archive. So we have a website and uh, with our very limited human resources, but we do our best to always record and post uh, and record all the projects with the text so that people, when they access to our website, they can understand uh, about the themes and context. And also um, we have Instagrams, which is very important platform for us to archive all our projects. And to talk about how we do is sometime as a researcher, I find very difficult to understand by looking at only a still image of the uh, kinetic artwork or sound piece. So uh, what we try to do is whenever we have a project, we shoot each individual artwork in a video form so that in the later, if uh, anyone who wants to study about what we presented, they can have a very clear sense of how it works. And also we try to capture how the audience interact. So that's important um, way we archive. And the one thing that I can add is I don't know whether this is about archiving, but uh, in relation to archiving, for me, it's been really hard to find uh, resources about media art in Indonesia. So uh, we decided to uh, try to also write our uh, research paper. And then whenever there is an opportunity, we, we try to present at a conference, which can be also recorded, and they can be a good source of research and study. So, after archiving, I'd like to talk about resources. At CCBT, we have this archiving issue. So, it was some would you like to talk about that challenge and possibly the future vision and target? It's difficult, but at CCBT, yes, we do want to archive. There are many different ways that we wish to do this, but as a matter of fact, Due to limited resources, we are not able to do that yet. But obviously, the art that should be publicized, as I mentioned earlier, we will try to make recording. For example, technical repair, we try to make sure we keep the technical record of the repair. And for the overall archive, that's something to be done in the future. Although we do have a plan, we have not been able to implement that. 
So for what, for whom, these are very important questions to ask. At Exploratorium, I think one of the challenges is really inheriting the artwork displays. At usual museums, there will be somebody who keeps maintaining displays. But displays that are created by residents, how do you make sure they will stay and display for a long time? Displays, we have archive, we have database of all the art displayed. Exploratorium stuff made art as well. I actually did some study on Iwai san. I found a record on Iwai san, the document about Mr. Iwai, who was a resident. So, people who came as artists and residents, we do have documents. For actual physical displays, we have Pier 15 and Pier 17. These are the spaces we own. They are both vast warehouses. One is used as a museum. The other warehouse is, some people say this is a graveyard of displays. Old displays, old artwork that were created long time ago was stored there. Sometimes we pull some of the old displays out of this warehouse. So we tend to keep our artifact artwork for a long time. So the art created by Iwai, uh, we will be able to be able to see that. We have a document in a digital format. I'm not sure whether there's a physical display created by Iwai sons still there or not. So production, as you keep producing, it comes with a challenge of making recording, records, documentation. So we, since we talked about resources, in terms of cultural resources, money, people, and information, these are basic resources we need for cultural activities. I asked earlier what qualities do you expect as an artist to Miss Matsumoto. So let's think about qualities of artists. What kind of people are you collaborating with in case of headed out and alcohol labs? What type of artist do you work with? As resident artist, what qualities do you expect? What do you want to who do you want to work with? Uh, who we are working with. Uh, we have, uh, as a very small independent uh, institution, without so many great, wonderful collaborator collaborators and partners, it is impossible for us to do any single project. So um, we have many artist collectives in Indonesia. As you may know, uh, uh, the art artists, uh, the Indonesia, the people in general, they are really good supporter and helper to others. And then many, many people love to work together because they think that the, uh, there will be a synergy by working together. So the artist collectives, they, um, they have individuals who has uh, many different expertise and many different knowledges and they, they're willing to help. So whenever we have a project and if the artist collective um, uh, what they do is quite rele relevant to what we want to do, and we approach them, then uh, we can work with them. And also we have uh, collaborations with some other cultural institutions, and actually I've been working very closely with many Korean art and culture institutions from Korea, so that is why um, we were able to also invite uh, several Korean artists every year to present uh, their media art and also develop some exchanges between the different uh, countries. So, and also this is uh, something that we are actually planning to do and we are very interested in collaboration with uh, like scientists and we, we did, uh, we worked with the robotists before, but after that we couldn't continue for our projects. So we are next year actually work, 
uh, are planning to work with biologists and other like science laboratory uh, researchers as well. So our collaborators and partners are really diverse and um, it's, it's actually very, very important uh, for us to uh, move forward our projects. So what about the Helidao? Um, yeah, I think that's uh, the same for us. Um, we have some collaborations that we try to also um, transform into long-term uh, collaborations. For example, we've been having a pilot residency, joint residency program now with the archive of, of the avant-garde that is uh, soon to be opened in Dresden, which is a private collection that has now been donated to the city of Dresden. And the archive is a real archive. So it has never been displayed. And what they are doing right now is that they kind of try to open this archive with different artists to, ac to actually dig into the archive. And they approached us to also have a, um, performative background for this kind of approach to this archive and we've been working or we have been recommended uh, two of our artists that we also worked together with before um, and they uh, will soon present the the findings of their of their um, research um, and also I think for us it's because we've we are quite an institution of some size we are not only um, concentrating on also promoting and displaying um, established artists that we, or like our house and also um, our programmers have been working with for some time, but it's also to, um, to, yeah, um, to promote and also to um, yeah, see younger generations of artists, um, how they can come first into being and becoming an artist. So we also work together with the, um, the Paluka uh, School, for example, uh, in Dresden, but also the uh, Academy for, for the Arts. So we have a contact with also these younger generations to come, that they also have a place, because we are a house for the independent ar arts. That means for young people and students that are just graduating, it's sometimes hard to get a foot into the door and we really want that also, that we are open to these um, uh, people and also to, to their visions. And I think it's really this kind of, it's not a dialogue, but it's like this multi-logue between uh, established artists that have been around for so many years. For example, Gob Squad, they are celebrating their 30th anniversary next year. Um, and then we have younger artists and collectives that are just formatting now. And I think it's really this addressing and being open to, to these that we want to, uh, want to proceed like this, yeah. Thank you very much. So I wasn't quite sure about the size. Exploratorium, I understand that your museum is so large, Alco Labs, you said it's very small. So can you talk about how many staff members working in your museum so that we understand the size of your museum? Um, at the beginning, there were three And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, right now, as a full-time, two, including me, and the one who is always participating, but she cannot work like full-time, but she work project-based, and we have uh, also project-based research assistant, and there are several assistants who help. So the main members are two, <laughs> but there are many other than them. CCBT <laughs> So how about CCBT? In the case of CCBT, so this space itself is run by several members. And the way we are hired are different, but then uh, including technical people, it's about 10 people working here. So can I ask her exploratory, exploratorium, it's a very skippy. 
something stuff um, 50 years ago. Now, <laughs> 350 something, I think. Yeah. So again, it was 50 years ago? It's 50 something. Um, no, actually, no, no, I would say. When we just started out, it was probably Frank and his family and his friends, so like less than 10. But soon, um, because uh, Frank was really good at getting funding, so he was hiring a lot of people. He actually hired um, Ron, his Ron son, uh, as a high school student. Yeah, so, so that was a dream job for Ron son. Um, you know, as a high school student, he also got paid um, by the Exploratorium, and then he's still it's, it's been like 50 years since he started out that's as a staff. So how about you, Herera, including how the changes have been made for the number of workers? We're talking about the staff. Say for the last few years. So um, now we are uh, 50 people. Um, working at Hellerau, we are also having uh, three permanent um, positions for um, volunteers in their cultural year. So they're working also with us for one year. And we are also a place for uh, people to get educated in like technical jobs and uh, stagehands. Um, but this wasn't the case up until January, because we were before that a, a team of around 30 people, and then we worked with a, a pool of free technicians that had been running the house as the actual soul, one might say, uh, for, for the last um, also 25 years. So they've been, some of them been there from the first day when Hellerau got opened again. Um, and that were around 50 people that were also working with us on, on a like project basis. And um, exactly, so some, some of our staff that we is now part of the team, they are also only there for a project and then they will leave again. So the Cure team is a little smaller and the program team itself, uh, it's... Um, five people permanently and then another three, now four people um, working um, in a project. Thank you, thank you. So now I think we understand our scope and our collabs and CCBT. Maybe 50 years ago or ahead, maybe we might grow to having 300 people or 350 people within a team. So the size of the scope of the institution and the resource are very different from our sizes. However, it's very important the lab should be changeable in order to be catering to the needs of the time. And when the scope or the size becomes larger and larger, I think it is going to be an issue that is difficult to maneuver. So today we heard about media art and technology, using technology for art. So we are able to move in a different way in a traditional uh, art. However, uh, the lab of the the function of the lab is linked to that. So you mentioned about your team, including the collaborator. How are you going to be revising over or reviewing your activity in the change of the demand of the time? So do you have any idea on this? how you would be changing along with the time. Maybe we can start with Matsumoto-san regarding Exploratorium within our building. We have a visitor research department. So the way of our doing or whatever, the output of the exhibition is working well or not, uh, those that function is giving us a chance for a feedback from the usual people, the audiences. You mean the response could be confirming through that department? Yes, it's based on project and it's also related to funding. So it's not having all of the 
area. However, let's say there's a new project and then there's a researcher looking over for the whole term of the exhibition and thinking about whether the wording of the prompt is okay or not, or whether the exhibition is communicating well with the audiences or not. In various aspects, he or she makes the evaluation. Thank you so much. And about the topic of technology, today uh, we're talking about AI as well. And the technology will be changing according to the time. So how are you going to be responding? Are, is that done by specialists? Or do you have any topics that you would like to follow? How are you going to be discussing and coming to the technology? For exploratory, we don't have a department that specializes for technology. Well, we do have a media department. So the vision of Mr. Frank was that not focusing too much on technology from the very first. So there's a reason, because it's a technology is a black box and we cannot understand. And exploratory it really focuses on uh, whether it is honor honest and understandable. It's just about the scientific phenomena that we focus on. So we do use technology. However, it's a means for us, and it's not the end for exploratorium. Thank you for your answer. So Herera, may I ask the same question to you? So right now, you are now reviving yourself, recovering yourself. That was shown within your presentation. And the production team as a lab, in order to change according to the time, what is your activity? If there should be any, I would like to definitely know. Um, for us, it's also we are on a constant or constantly changing. First, because the, the building is still in a process of uh, being constructed and uh, we will have a new space that we also need to somehow approach and start programming for. And of course, we have ideas for this already and we're waiting. Um, but I think what's quite important for, our, for the rhythm of our working is we have every weekend we have another show. There, there are some artists come back, they come back after two years, they come back after 10 years. So the time that we actually spend with one another is very short and we kind of get glimpse to one another um, in collaborating and sometimes they stay for residency or for a longer stay. But this is quite short in the sense that we kind of need to be very aware of the immediate feedback we are getting from our let's say, Friday show, and then we have another show on Saturday and Sunday, and we come back the next week and kind of also see, okay, was this actually working, working out? And sometimes it's, it's working out in the sense that we get really good feedback, that we have a lot of visitors coming for, for, the, for this weekend, and sometimes it's understandably or not really to understand that some, some projects and productions um, seem to, to miss a first audience and sometimes they really need to come back like the artist another year or so and then you see that also the feedback from the audience is quite quite different. So it's always for us, it's kind of a, um, I don't know what's the English term for it, but we're kind of, until some point, we're kind of a little blind flying into the evening and then we will see how it actually evolves. But that's also the magic of theatre. So, yeah. Thank you very much. How about alcohol levels? How are you catering to the change of times, please? Um, use Explore as an example to talk about this topic uh, that since uh, for the curator focus program, it's been three years, and I found some changes within those three years. Uh, compared to the previous years, the more applicants are not from the major cities, uh, but uh, the cities outside uh, the Java Island, which is really good because that's what we've been trying to do through the festival, that we wanted to make more access accessible environment and more balanced development in media arts. Uh, but then in, in other sense, 
uh, my team and I also kind of curious why, <laughs> why more applicants not from the Jakarta or some certain cities, but other parts. So we want to evaluate, yeah. And because we think that it's very important for us to be very useful. So, and we want to be useful, and then if we feel that we are not so useful for the group of curators or even society, uh, we, we must change. So we like to evaluate, and then once we are done with the final uh, presentation by the last participants in January that we are, we are planning to uh, maybe gather and discuss very openly uh, and we also want to hear about their feedbacks. Uh, uh, but uh, at the same time, we also think that it's also good to have, rather than the same format of the incubation, we think that maybe it's time for us to gather the, uh, the cura young curators in Indonesia and also give them a chance to present their, uh, uh, their, their project. Uh, and we want to learn about their curatorial approaches uh, I mean that those who are not part of the incubations, but we also learn from other uh, curators about their curator approaches. So that's what we are planning to do very soon. So since you have a very small team, you're trying to find every possible opportunity to learn. And exactly that's what we want to do. So Ito-san, you can answer your personal view. What do you think is necessary for lab? How should lab evolve and respond to the times? What everyone has said is important. Think of a community or students and teachers. So this is the contact points of people. We can get information from that contact point. And also it is important to review what happened. And if you can create a method to make a self-review, that's wonderful that we haven't a review system yet. Or another thing is that uh, you can try to do everything that comes to your mind that's very important. And I think you can really explore uh, all kinds of ways and try to do and what what well, you can continue. I think that is a sort of a common thread. Love and experiments are really common factors throughout different uh, hubs. Uh, we received questions. For a lab to function successfully, we talked about how to change mindset and so forth. But on the other hand, you need software, hardware, equipment, facilities. You all need these physical resources as well. Our class, what sort of software do you use and infrastructure you use? So how do you make sure you have necessary resources? I'll study with Matsumoto-san first. So about software, I don't know, I can't answer, but when it comes to hardware, we make sure that we use standard parts and components so that your display can be applicable to different purposes. Yes, cybernetic serendipity show that I mentioned, why it we were able to keep it for two years. The parts that are used are mostly standard parts, so they are accessible. You can purchase those spare parts easily. So low-cost, familiar parts, everyday materials should be used to make displays. And so this has been our DNA. So cybernetic serendipity was it uh, from UK? Yes, the initial event was in London, and it went to Washington. And the last day of that event, Frank went there. So London, Washington, D.C., and he talked to the organizer. And after the Washington, D.C., please come to San Francisco, he asked the organizer. He, they actually, he was involved with truck transportation from Washington to San Francisco. 
there must have been a globalization in the background. So, Ito-san, it is important to use standard parts and technologies. What do you think? Yes, that is most important. I mean, one of the most important things. Here at the CCBT, we have facilities and parts and components. Uh, as, she, as she pointed out, to make sure that we have standard low-cost parts. Thank you. So what about Helenau? When you have facilities and equipment, anything that you care about uh, to make sure that you have uh, easy operation in terms of facilities? Um, yeah, of course. Um, so as I said, we are a production house and we have ever, an ever-changing program every week. But of course, these things need to be quickly installable and also quickly to dismantle. And for these um, processes, we are also in close contact and communication with the production. So they send a technical writer a few weeks ahead. So our technical team already knows when they need what equipment, because this is also something, you know, the, the productions come in house. They sometimes have their stage design with them, but most of the technical equipment they get in house. So what our technical team is mostly doing throughout the week is puzzling, seeing what is needed when, where. And for this, it's actually, there is actually a need for a, a software to also manage this. And this is a huge discussion at our uh, house at the moment, because there are some on the market as specialized for theater. But this is for rather big houses, and uh, it, for us it's way smaller, so we don't need all the um, whole programming. So a dear colleague of ours is doing some of the programming on his uh, yeah, coffee table on the side, so to also facilitate these, these kind of uh, processes. Yeah. Thank you very much. So you have to build it quickly, you have to dismantle quickly, easy installation, you can clear that out easily. That's very, very important as an experiment. So Ito-san, what is your opinion? What do you think? What? Software? No. In easy installable equipment, you experiment, you can clean that up easily. It's important, is it? Yes, it is important. Being quick. It's very important so that you can move on to the next. Thank you. Alcohol Labs, you do not have physical facilities, meaning that you are perhaps most flexible. So how do you network with people who can provide uh, infrastructure or facilities? But having our own venue, how do I get other facilities? Uh, as I said earlier, there are so many great partners in Indonesia. They, they have a very different philosophy of life that they feel they, even though they have a, a very limited resources, they like to help other people. They really care about others. So in Jakarta, there are several arts and culture institutions Oh, that have a beautiful venues and then I've been working with them so many times and then they are not I never call them as a venue sponsor because uh, uh, We normally collaborate so their curatorial team and our curatorial team <laughs> We we meet together. So we we from the beginning we develop together. So um, many uh, the venues, our institutions that have a beautiful venues in Jakarta, they have uh, supported our programs um, whenever we propose to them our ideas and also other parts like Jog Jakarta. Last time we had an exhibition about space science in uh, July and then it was actually funded by Korea Foundation, but a uh, French Institute, they have a beautiful gallery space as well as auditorium in Jogja, and they really liked the idea. So they also supported us as a collaborator. So it's very, I, I don't see it's difficult for me to, for us to find the venue to uh, the present uh, our, our programs. Thank you very much. So Ito-san, uh, for equipment. Equipment is crucial for a lab. So uh, are you 
Do you have any extra comment about that? No, I think all the other presenters have already answered what I wanted to answer. But when we were creating things, as Ms. Birte mentioned uh, from Herera, we need speed. So if we're testing one month after, after our ideation came, then we're no longer enthusiastic. We lose the passion. So we should be able to have an environment that we can test immediately in order for creation. So exploratory prototype, exploratorium, it was a very a stimulating comment that uh, Mizumoto-san mentioned. She just makes all the production at once and all the prototype is just shown to the auditors. From after here, I would like to have question and answers from the floor. But before that, one last question for production and lab, having those in the center of your activity. Each of you are in relation with the art and art scene. And what kind of an impact do you think are you giving to the audiences? So what impact do you give to the audiences through your activities was the question. So by having a lab, what is achievable? Yes, that could be it. And from any perspective, Maybe it's about the um, reason of existence of Exploratorium. We're educational institution. We're no art museum. We're not media art center. Anyhow, uh, this is our, we are an organization for education. And that being the backbone, having a lab and creating prototypes. So the machine shop being there existing at Exploratorium, we are very dynamic. So every day we understand that we are making production here and there's a message given out to the ordinary public that we are creating here and we have a philosophy. It doesn't have to be really uh, completed. It doesn't have to be finalized. It's just in experimental. And I think we are uh, giving out such a communication as an educational institution. Thank you. So, Birude-san, how about your side? Um, yeah, also, <laughs> I mean, also presentation can be a process in the sense that, like, having a, an evening um, at our house or something with a production that, for example, we are co-producing, um, giving them the chance and this first piece to come into being and being actually... Um, rehearsed in front of, of an audience. But uh, with the residency program, we also have the opportunity, and that is what we do quite oftenly, uh, is to also have an open studio. So also this whole time of rehearsing, which is in theater, always this myth of something then coming on stage, and you have actually no idea what's happening in the weeks and months before that. And this is actually, for me, I think the most magical time of a piece when it comes into being. And I think this is also what Hellera is also standing for, to also make these processes transparent or not transparent, but also accessible for, for the audience. So we have um, every month, we have an open studio, let's say, and um, I think this is also this, that we have the, the great opportunity because we are a production house, that we don't have to work with a fixed program that runs for a year, but we have the possibility to also react quite flexible to um, developments coming either unexpectedly or that come quite expectedly and haven't had have not the, the platform yet to be actually shown or talked about or being exhibited and performed. Thank you, Yoksan. Please. To answer this question, maybe I have to answer this question. To answer this question, maybe I have to answer this question. 私たちのプロジェクトの観客になってくださった方をすべて思い浮かべなければならないと思います。そしてプログラムの中で一番印象に残ったものは、その影響は、例えば、社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社会や社
Uh, so maybe for the artists, our program is uh, not just uh, simply like selecting the existing artworks, but whenever we start to develop our concept, we communicate a lot with the artists so that artists can challenge about the issues that we want to bring, and also artists to try to create the new uh, body of works. So that's, that's sort of a challenging and giving kind of a like, the assignments to the artists can be a good way for them to also improve themselves. And for the people, maybe because uh, during the presentation I mentioned about, we tried to touch on a variety of uh, themes uh, for our presentation. So uh, those themes are highly related, it's very related to our current issues that we day by day uh, we experience. Uh, so like, you know, the climate changes or like digital transformation. So we through by touching on those themes that we want to find a way to contribute to our society. But by by saying that, like contributing to the society, I, I don't think we can actually give any tangible solution to the people. But at least uh, through our projects, we try to help the people to aware of what's going on uh, around us, what's going on around the world, so they become more aware from our uh, programs. Thank you so much. So I think you've said it all, but Ito-san, how about you? You can just uh, mention about YCAM experience. So having y uh, YCAM, how did the local area change? If there should be anything that you can share with us, please. Well, you made the, you made the bar high for me to participate and make a comment. But anyhow, dialogue with everybody and we can do an experiment. And that's what makes a lab function, basically. I've been always been having a behavior that everything, every project that I do is a lab experiment. And those people, artists who are engaging with us, according to their engagement, we are changing and we will be taking that input in ourselves too. And experimenting and experiencing is also going to be related to our outcome as well. Thank you. So taking the last minutes, uh, let's go into the question and answers. Um, maybe it could be including Slido questions, but then if you do have any questions from the floor, maybe I would like you to open up your question. Kihara-san, please. So, if there's any, like, is there any failure that you overcame as an organization? <laughs> or, like, any hurdles, like, big hurdles that you came across? I mean, anything, if there's any, sorry, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Many. <laughs> <laughs> Working in the arts is a hurdle sprint, no? Like you finish and you overcome one problem. Uh, I think also culture is very, or cultural, the cultural industry is very focused on problematizing things. So yeah. let's take it as a challenge. Uh, and I think we had quite some challenges, of course. That means for our institution, for our structures, as I said, we've been working with uh, a lot of freelance technicians and uh, that were around 50, and we had to cope and deal with the city that these ca become permanent um, positions at our house, but of course, it were only 10 out of 50. So this is something, this meant a, a huge transition also socially for the people that we used to work with and were part of the house. And it also means in terms of funding, we are a house, although we are a state funded by the city of Dresden or a state uh, stage, we have most, let's say 50% of the um, 
budget for our program is through funding projects. So part of my job, for example, is to write applications, and I do this every month. Um, so this is another hurdle, and this always means we have some program that we're thinking of that we're planning ahead. So for now, we're starting to plan the year 2005. Um, but we now, I don't know, that is for you, the year 2004 and then some year of 2005. Um, but we, we still don't know if we can all finance these festivals to, and programs that we are thinking of. And this also comes, like especially the funding structure for our house, the f uh, financial structure of our house is that while we're um, writing a lot of applications for our program, this also transforms our program rather into something being um, more focused on festivals because these are the, the events and also programs that you can apply for. It's not for the, let's say, running program. So this is always like a two-bill two thing that we, we need to program in our heads. And I think this is also something that will never, in this sense, change. It will it will remain a challenge for, for the next decades. <laughs> Ms. Matsumoto, failure. Uh, I believe that there has been funding failure. I've been with this museum for 12 years, and on twice occasions there are major layoffs. So, because of the funding mishandling, really major layoffs. 18% uh, of the employment uh, were cut off. They had to leave the museum. So I would say that's a major failure. Thank you, Jong Song. Uh, yeah, I think the biggest challenge is about fund fundraising uh, for us as well, so, uh, because all our program uh, heavily uh, rely on funding. And that is also why the earlier of our uh, organization, um, we had a small, even small, we had a venues uh, for about three years. Uh, but at the same time, we had many projects outside. Uh, but so it's, we, we love to have our venue, and then we love to have activities happening in our venues, but uh, it was really hard uh, to secure the fund for the management of the physical venue because we have to use the fund for the contents and programs and other people. So um, we decide to not have the venue, but more focus on the pro programs and projects outside because there were so many. But the good thing is always if there is a challenge and if we... Uh, very sensitive, open-minded, and work hard, then we always, there is a way to overcome. So since we try so hard, uh, making lots of networks, and also uh, learn from others, and without venue, we have to go out so many other places, which is also really good for us, that we were able to visit so many different places in, across Indonesia. And we also learn so many different ways of working by the people in different cities. So that becomes another opportunities because one, so challenge overcome, another good opportunity comes back. And challenge overcome, another good opportunity comes back. It's like a chain. But I think this chain is not just like this level, but it seems like keep going up, keep going up in a more positive and better way. So I, I see very positive way. Thank you. I think we are running out of uh, time, so we have to close this session. We talked about creating love, production, hello, exploratorium. They both have long history. We were able to listen to what they can offer. We are very lucky. And Alcolab and CCBT, these are new facilities. We're able to have joint discussion. This is a great honor to receive you all today. Uh, so we will conclude. But once again, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Please give them a round of applause.
Radio Comas Tumbuka from Explorer Roy here. From Helena, we have Miss Dottie Sonnenberg. From Alto Lab, we have Miss John Ogjan. Thank you so much for joining us today. And very lastly, from CCBT, we have a little announcement. From CCBT, this is the announcement. In January to March, we have business season at CCBT. Artists and other partners collaborate together. As you can see, we actually renovate used uh, household appliances into equipment. CCBT Artist Fellow, we have a new project starting. CCBT, mainly on weekends, we have open studio. So please come visit us on weekends. And this is Artist Fellow Tim Press project from January 12th to 21st, every day, they're going to hold a workshop. CCBT is really the starting point. There'll be 30 minutes course, you walk around the street when you come back. AI will give you a journal of that street walk and how that is different from the perception of the worker himself. So you can visit all the exciting places in Shibuya uh, we are asking for applications. And the highlight of this year, we have Hirameku Dojo. In January, February, this is the introduction to biotechnology. Please do participate. And in February, we have short-term camp. This is volume three. The theme is diversity and inclusion, focusing on inclusive design. Program director is Aidak Sem and Shichiro Ito. Thank you once again for joining us close to the end of the year. Please do cooperate in filling out the survey and make sure you return the translation devices. Thank you so much. <laughs>